that matters. Animal welfare is useless. Indeed, I think it's worse than useless. It's counterproductive. And I, but I'm going to talk all about that. But that's that's the uh, bio, bio in a nutshell. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. <laughs> Definitely has got people interested. Definitely got me interested. Um, well, yeah, I guess um, you wanted to do the quick or – for however long I guess you wanted, right? Uh, speech, definitely uh, let us know about this abolitionist approach, what issues you have with the mainstream organizations, and I guess why you think uh, welfareism is next and useless. It's actually it's actually worse than useless. But right. um, <laughs> it's worse. It's a lot worse than useless. Um, oh, a lot, all right. A lot worse than useless. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Um, all right. Well, basically, um, the abolitionist approach to animal rights uh, is – is a, a sort of a theory that has six principles. These things were developed not as a theory at the outset, but basically were things that um, I put together over the years because they constitute how I how I sort of developed my own thinking about animal rights. But uh, let me tell you about the six principles of the abolitionist approach. The first one is that all sentient beings have a right not to be used as property. Uh, let's think about human rights for a second. We may agree or disagree about what rights humans have. You know, people people debate these issues. Uh, some people think that humans should have a right to health care. Some people disagree with that. Some people think that humans should have a right uh, that, 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 I mean, they should have all sorts of rights, and then other people disagree with their having all sorts of rights. But the one right that we pretty much don't disagree about. The one that we all pretty much agree on is that all humans have the right not to be property. We all reject slavery, chattel slavery. Uh, indeed, chattel slavery is can, it, it's one of the few things that is prohibited under uh, customary international law, and it's against the law of every nation on earth. Now, that doesn't mean that pro that slavery doesn't exist. It does, but nobody defends it. Everybody recognizes that slavery is a really bad thing. That that it's worse than treating people in ways that we would say is, is discriminatory. I mean, we can have we can have debates about whether particular treatment constitutes discrimination, but we all agree that chattel slavery, buying and selling human beings, treating human beings as things, is a really bad idea. And the reason why we all agree on that is because if someone is a slave, then it's not that they're a lesser member of the moral or legal community, but they're not a member at all of the moral or legal community. They're outside of the moral or legal community. They are property. You can buy them. You can sell them. You can value all of their interests at zero if you wish. If you are the owner of a slave, you can value all of that person's interests at zero and, and negate their lives. You can end their lives. You can, you can take away everything that is important to them if you value it in a particular way. We recognize that as problematic. And so we say that every human, whether they're intelligent or not intelligent, or beautiful or not beautiful, or rich or not rich, whatever, all humans are irrespective of their characteristics. They are, they have a right not to be a slave, not to be a chattel slave. Because we recognize that's the least that you must have. That's the least amount of protection you must have if you're going to be a member of the moral community and legal community at all. We can then discuss whether or not you're an equal member or whether you're being treated fairly or whatever, but we can't even get to that point if you're outside of the legal or moral community altogether because you're a slave, because you're a thing, because you're property, because you have no intrinsic or inherent interest, a, a, a value. You only have an economic value. You only have an extrinsic value. You only have the value that is accorded to you. And so we recognize this where, where humans are concerned. It's not even controversial. I mean, it really isn't even controversial. I mean, I'm sure that there are people who think that that maybe we ought to bring back slavery. Um, but as a general matter, they don't say it. Um, and, and nobody really, I mean, nobody really, 
really defends chattel slavery. They may defend low wages, they may defend exploiting people in all sorts of ways, but nobody maintains that we ought to be buying and selling human beings and that some humans ought to own other humans and ought to be able to treat them exclusively as means to the ends of the humans who own them. Nobody defends that position. Problem is, that's what animals are. All animals are property. They are things. They have no value. They have no inherent or intrinsic value. They only have extrinsic or external value. They have the value that we accord them. That's all. Right now in in my house, I have five rescued dogs. Uh, Three of them were cruelty cases. One was born uh, the day after her mom was removed from a puppy mill. And one is a blind and deaf dog uh, who was uh, a dog that was uh, bred. They take uh, uh, certain sort of Shelties, uh, gray Shelties, and they breed them to try to get white Shelties. And uh, 25% of every litter is blind or deaf or both. And we found out about a breeder who had one of these dogs who, had, uh, who was blind and deaf. And uh, this person was going to kill the dog, drown the dog, which is what breeders, a lot of breeders do. And uh, we took the dog. So those are our five dogs. We love them. But you know what? I could put them in the car right now. They're my property. They are things that I own. I'm a, I love them. I regard them as members of my family. And I'm sure if you have non-human companions who, who you know, you regard them as members of your family as well, well, but that's just because they're your property and you can value them any way you want. And so you can regard them as members of your family. You can keep them as guard dogs or as, as mice catching cats in your store or whatever. You can just use them in any, basically in any way you want. There are laws, anti-cruelty laws, but they're pretty much useless. Um, and you can you can treat you treat your animals pretty badly, but the bottom line is is that these animals are are members of my family. I, I love them, I adore them. But if I wanted to, I could stick them in a car right now, drive them to a shelter, and say, find a home for these animals. And 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 if you don't, you can kill them because that's what happens when you take a dog to a shelter. They make you sign right. a, a a property. You know you have to relinquish your property in the animals. And, and um, so you sign something that says, if you can't find a home, you can kill them. I can take these dogs to a veterinarian and say, put these dogs to sleep, a euphemism for kill the dogs. They're my property. I can value their interests, including their interests in continued life at zero. And I can kill them if I want or cause them to be killed. Indeed, in many states, you can kill them. You can kill your animals yourself as long as you do so humanely, whatever that means. Um, you do, you can, you can. Uh, you can kill them yourself. So animals are property. And as long as they're property, they're never going to matter. And what we need to do is to, we need a paradigm shift where we stop thinking about animals as property and that we recognize that they all have a, a, a moral right not to be regarded as property. Once enough of us think that, then there will be legal rights that will protect them. But until that point, the law is useless until there's until there's a substantial social movement that has a that, that that where the moral where the thinking has shifted as a matter of the moral paradigm the the law is useless absolutely useless people talk about animal rights law i mean it's like talking about santa claus or the easter bunny it's a fantasy um, we can talk about that more if you'd like, but, but animal law is a general matter the laws that protect animals are pretty much useless because animals are property and um, so the first principle of the abolitionist approach is that all sentient beings but sentience is simply subjective awareness it's a it's a it's a, a level of consciousness it's it's basically the the fundamental level of consciousness of subjective awareness okay so all sentient beings um sh- should be regarded as having a a moral right not to be used as 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 commodities, as things that exist exclusively for uh, the use of others, owners. The the am I, am I, I'm getting I'm getting little messages. Um, wait, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, am oh. I so, am oh no, I, ignore I'm, them. Yeah, no, ignore everyone. I'll I'll deal okay. with. Uh, okay, yeah. all, right, all right. Tell me if I'm supposed to pay attention to anything. Okay, all right, all right. All right. Um, all right. 
So, um, and hi to you, D best ever. Hi, hi. Yes, let's be friends. We can be friends. All right. Okay. The, so that's the first principle is that all sentient beings have the right not to be regarded as property. The second principle is that if animals have a right not to be property, we shouldn't be using them. And therefore, we should not not be supporting the humane exploitation of animals. I regard the animal welfare position as problematic in a number of respects. First of all, animal welfare doesn't work. Let's be clear. It doesn't work. Because animals are property, remember you just heard that two minutes ago, because animals are property, it costs money to protect. They're, they're e animals are economic commodities. OK, and it costs money to protect their interests. It costs money to, for me to protect the interests of my dogs. I have to get them dental care and veterinary care and all this other sort of stuff. I mean, it costs money to do that. If you own animals that are being used for food or for any other purpose, it costs money for you to protect their interests. Because animals are property, you aren't going to spend that money unless it's economically uh, uh, meaning for you, to, meaningful for you to do that. You aren't just going to spend that money. You're not just going to say, oh, fine, let's give all the animals much more space and a much better life because that is going to increase the cost of animal products. So one of the things I've done in my, in my academic life is I wrote a book <laughs> almost 30 years ago, a long time ago, called Animals, Property, and the Law. And in this book, I argue that um, because animals are property, the standard of animal welfare, the level of animal welfare protection is always going to be very low. And it's going to be generally at the level that is required. You have to, you'll protect those interests that are required to be protected so that you can exploit the animals in an economically efficient way. Let me give you an example, which I hope will concretize it more for you. We have a law in the United States called the Federal Humane Slaughter Act. It requires that large animals be stunned before they're shackled, hoisted, and cut, unless it's for kosher or halal slaughter. Um, they have to be basically stunned before they're slaughtered. Now, if you look at the legislative history of the, of the Humane Slaughter Act, you see Congress basically says, in the preamble to the law, says, if you don't stun an animal, then it in you incur carcass damage. The animal's moving around. The animal's hanging upside down by a back leg. And we're talking about large animals. So that when you, you put a chain around the back leg of a cow and you hoist the cow up, the first thing that happens is her pelvis breaks and she's in a lot of pain. And so she's moving around a lot. And what does she do? She, she incurs carcass damage. That You lose money when that happens. And she hits workers, and you have worker injuries. So we have a law that says if it's not kosher or halal slaughter, then you have to stun the animal so that the animal is rendered unconscious during the slaughtering process. That's basically what animal welfare is. It is, there are rules, there are rules that require that you act as economically efficient, rational property owners, <laughs> okay? That's really, and, and if you look at animal welfare law, it doesn't really require much more. It doesn't require that property owners protect animals much more than the level that is required to exploit the animals for, in, in an economically efficient way, okay? so. Animal welfare doesn't work. It's always going to be very low. Yes, there will be times that there will be some, some efforts will, will, will actually add to production costs. But by and large, they don't. By and large, they make animal exploitation more efficient, economically efficient. And, and they don't result in much protection. It, to, to give you an, a, another example of this, Look at Whole Foods, which is one of the most horrible places in the universe. Um, and I shopped oh, wow. there. <laughs> well, I mean, it is. It's a terrible place. You know, you go in there and they've got the five levels, you know, the, the five levels of humane treatment, you know. Go and pick out what level of torture that you're willing to, you know, you're willing to pay for. Um, and, and 
the animals that are, mo- you know, now, now again, those are not legal requirements. What's happening is a market is developing largely as a result of animal welfare groups promoting these things because the, the you know, Whole Foods was promoted by PETA and by, by, by um, Mercy for Animals and by Compassion Over Killing and all these groups basically supported the development of these standards that, 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 that uh, Whole Foods uses. They're not legal standards. They're not required by law. Basically, what's happening is you're getting private companies like Whole Foods that are coming in and saying, well, we realize there's a bunch of people out there who've got more money. Then, you know, I mean, they're not poor. They're sort of middle class and upper middle class people. They can afford to spend more money. And we're going to offer them more humanely treated animal product. I mean, you know, more humanely produced animal products, right? And you take the you take the 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 level five or whatever the most humane level level is that that Whole Foods produces. And those animals are treated in ways that if humans were involved would constitute torture. The most humanely treated animals are treated horribly, absolutely horribly. And so animal welfare doesn't work. Even when we move from the, from the, the minimal requirements of the law and we move to these private companies that are now producing more humane, supposedly more uh, uh, you know, humanely made uh, uh, meat, dairy, and eggs, it's still horrible. Because the reality is, if you were going to get animal products that were produced from animals that did not have bad lives at all, that didn't, that weren't, where they, they weren't, they didn't suffer during their lives or at the moment of slaughter, you'd be paying so much money, if you could even get them, you'd be paying an, a, a huge amount of money. If you were willing to pay that amount of money, you wouldn't be eating animal products in the first place. If you cared that much or you were willing, you know, willing to pay whatever you'd have to pay to get these supposedly humanely produced products, you wouldn't be eating them in the first place. But the bottom line is animal welfare doesn't work. And certainly the standards you know, put aside the the supposedly better standards of of um, of uh, 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 Whole Foods and these other programs. Um, the bottom line is that um, animal welfare standards are always going to be very low because that's economics. That's simple economics. Okay, just think about it for a second. If if you're in a situation, and, 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 and this, this is a problem particularly because we now have these regional and international agreements. So if we're in a market with other nations in, you know, uh, on this side of the globe and nation one increases its welfare standards, well, unless they're able to keep out the products of all of the other nations, if the demand for the lower welfare product persists, then those products are going to are going to flood in and 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 ruin the market of the supposedly higher, you know, uh, 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 more humane products. So the bottom line is economics drives us people. This is simple. It's simple economics. You're going to you're going to protect your animals, your cows, your pigs, your chickens. You're going to protect them to the extent that it, it's econo- it makes economic sense for you to do. Look, farmers are capitalists. They're business people. You know, they, you, you demand beef, they'll give you beef. You demand bananas, they'll give you bananas. You go to the farmer and say, I'd like you to give these animals more space. Farmer's indifferent. Farmer says, look, I'll be happy to give the animals more space. But is that going to affect demand? And the answer is, yeah, that's going to affect demand. That's going to affect demand, and it's going to mean that 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 there will be production. You know, production costs will go up, demand will go down. So you got to understand this is a matter of economics. Animal welfare doesn't function in some vacuum. It functions in the reality of it functions in the in an economic reality. Okay, so that's one reason why animal welfare doesn't work. Another reason why animal welfare doesn't work. Is, is problematic is because think about this. If it's wrong to use animals, should we be promoting animal use, even if it's supposedly more humane? So, I mean, if you think slavery is bad, should you be promoting beating the slaves nine times a week rather than 10 times a week? Or should you be promoting the abolition of slavery? Because part of the problem is to the extent that you make people think 
that, it, that, that animal exploitation is being done in a better way, in a more humane way, in a more morally acceptable way, you encourage people to continue exploiting animals. Okay? So if it's wrong, we ought to, be, we ought to say it's wrong. Okay? The, the means to the ends should reflect the ends. So to say that, well, we really want to end it all, but we're going to use as a means to ending it all, we're going to promote um, humane use of animals. That the humane use of animals is going to lead to no use of animals. People, that's nuts. There's no, there is no evidence in history where... Reducing animal suffering has result has led in some way to ending that suffering. It doesn't work that way. <coughs> Excuse me. The more you make people think that there's an acceptable, morally, morally acceptable way of doing it, the more comfortable people are. You know, I mean, how many of us? I know, I know, I have. I mean, I spent my life doing this, but the, the number of people I have met who, who for a while didn't eat eggs for example and for example i was i was in britain right before the pandemic started and i was talking to people because the the, the europeans have a have a, 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 a the european community of which britain was a member of until fairly recently but they have a they have a you can no longer have conventional battery eggs they have to be at least enriched cages and now enriched cages are horrible um, you know, they're, they're also horrible, but by, by the way, it's so our cage free eggs. They're horrible too. Um, and you know, and free range, free range is as meaningless as a standard. Um, and, and so you've now got people who are eating eggs who didn't used to eat eggs because they say, well, now I don't feel bad about eating eggs because the eggs are being produced more humanely. That's the problem with that sort of animal welfare. It encourages people to continue to consume animal products. Um, another thing, uh, and I realize this is controversial, but what the hell, um, a, a, a part of this second principle that, that abolitionists don't promote welfare reform is abolitionists don't promote single issue campaigns. Single issue campaigns are also insidious for the same reason. We point that foie gras, foie gras and we say, this is really bad. So you get coalitions together of people who eat animal products. They eat steak and they eat all this other stuff. And then they point fingers at people who eat, who eat foie gras and they say, they're bad. That's bad. So what you do is you identify some sort of animal exploitation as worse than other things. And, and by implication, that the, the other things that aren't targeted are better. Say, this is what we've been doing with fur, for example. You know, ever since I've been alive, um, there's been an anti-fur campaign. As a matter of fact, when I first got involved with this issue in the 1980s, <laughs> excuse me, in the early 1980s, the main, the main issue then was fur. Well, what the hell is the difference between fur and wool and leather? There ain't none. Okay, there right, is no right. there is no difference, is there? I mean, I mean, I mean, what's leather is is skin with the with the hair off of it, and fur is skin with the hair on it. That's all. There is no morally morally significant difference. And so, what we do is we say, well, people who wear fur, and that historically has been women, but people who wear fur, they're bad people. And I, w those of us who wear wool and leather, we're better people than those people who wear fur. This is the problem with single issue campaigns. They make no sense. It's like, you know, people get all upset about, you know, Chinese people or Korean people eating dogs. Should they be eating dogs? No. But the idea that you've got people who eat chickens and pigs and fish and, and eggs and dairy, you know, uh, uh, saying that, that people who eat dogs are bad or that they are somehow worse. Um, and the answer is, that's nonsense. That's just xenophobic, ethnocentric bullshit. Um, and, so, um, and so I think it's really important to understand. And, and that's what most of, these, most of these animal organizations, and this is why I think they're so problematic, is that most of them promote welfare reform campaigns, which I think are problematic for the reasons I just told you. And they promote... Uh, these single issue campaigns, which I think are insidious because they they promote the idea that some forms of animal exploitation are acceptable or more acceptable than other forms. And I think that that's a really bad idea, uh, a bad thing to promote. The third principle is that if animals matter at all, veganism is a moral imperative. I am so tired of of having animal people tell me 
that it's extreme to say that veganism is a moral imperative, i.e., it's a moral obligation. It's not a question about, you know, it's not a question about uh, if animals matter morally, whatever else we, whatever, whatever our other obligations are to them, we have to stop eating them, wearing them, using them, and treating them as things. If we say that animals matter morally, then we should stop treating them as things because as long as we're eating them, wearing them, using them, they are nothing but things. We don't need, we don't need to be eating animals. I, I, this is my 40th year, 40 years as a vegan, and I ain't dead yet. And I'm sure that I am much, 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 much older than everybody, all of you now that are listening to me. Um, and, you know, I, I, it ain't, it's not necessary to eat animal products. As a matter of fact, mainstream healthcare people are telling us the more animal products we eat, the, the more we're likely to get diseases. But certainly, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to, I don't want to say, you know, whether it's more healthy to be a vegan. I, I personally believe it's more healthy to be a vegan than not be a vegan. But, but um, it's certainly, you're certainly not going to be less healthy as a vegan, as long as you're eating a sensible vegan diet, if you're eating nothing but iceberg lettuce, then it's not a vegan diet. It's just a stupid diet. But, um, but as long as you're eating <laughs> a, a sensible vegan diet, um, you're going to, you know, you're, you're not going to be less healthy than somebody who's eating animal products. So it's not necessary. And so if, therefore, if, if you're eating animal products because you like the taste or because it's traditional or because it's convenient, or whatever, what you're saying is, is what your actions are saying is that you regard animals as things, as things that you, you're not even requiring a necessity. You're not even you're not even saying, well, if it comes to a if it comes to a person, a human versus a, 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 a an animal, the human's going to win. We're not talking about any sort of compulsion. We're not talking about any sort of compulsion whatsoever. We're talking about people eat animal products because they like the taste. And as long as that's the case, if you're an if you're an animal person. I always say this to people, and, you know, people who tell me they love animals, but they eat them. I say, you know, every time I hear that, it sort of reminds me of somebody who says, I love my partner, but I beat her. Um, you cannot possibly think that animals matter morally while you are eating them or wearing them, you know, or, or you know, wearing them or using them for some other frivolous purpose. You simply can't do it. So veganism is a moral imperative. It's what we ought to do. I don't believe in this meatless Monday any more than I would believe in, you know, racist free Monday. Let's let's not be racist on Monday. I mean, if if we're if if there are rights involved here, if there are moral rights involved here, then we have to take them seriously. And you don't take them seriously when you tell people don't eat meat on Monday. Because first of all, you're telling them that there's a morally coherent distinction between dairy and eggs and meat. There isn't. They all involve suffering. They all involve death. As a matter of fact, you're more responsible for, you're responsible for more deaths if you eat eggs than if you eat beef, okay? Because chickens are smaller uh, and because of the number of, 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 of animals that are involved in the production of eggs and the number of deaths in the egg industry, you're more responsible. If you don't eat any beef, but you're just eating um, eggs, you're responsible for more animal deaths than if you're eating just beef. So, I mean, this idea that, you know, that meat-free Monday is a, tr is a really, in my mind, offensive concept. Um, it's a really offensive concept. You know, particularly, you know, I, every Monday I put out some meme on, and you know, that's actually my, the the people who help me, the the wonderful volunteers who help me on the on the um, on, my, on the Facebook page, they they come up with these great memes um, that they attach quotes from me on, um, and and you know, one of the ones that I really love is they say, you know, tell tell the calf, tell the mother whose calf has just been taken away from her, so that we can have a dairy industry. Tell that, you know, tell that animal that you're not eating meat on Monday. You know, I mean, there, there is no morally coherent distinction between meat, dairy, eggs, any of this stuff. And, and so, you know, I, I really think we've got to, veganism is the bottom line. It's the baseline. We might owe, owe animals more, but we certainly owe them. If they matter morally, we owe them um, 
the, uh, uh, we owe them to not eat them, wear them, or use them. So veganism is a moral imperative. The fourth principle is that sentience is the only characteristic that matters. You know, we always hear animal people talking about, well, you know, what about non-human great apes? Or what about elephants? And they can think this way, and they, they're much more cognitively sophisticated, and blah, 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 blah. And the answer is interesting from an ethological point of view. From a moral point of view, it doesn't matter at all. As far as I'm concerned, there is absolutely no moral difference between um, a, a chimpanzee and a mouse. I mean, they're obviously different animals, but the fact that the fact that some animals are more like us, um, so what? I mean, that's like saying some some black people have greater moral value because they're light skinned. That's actually that actually has been a, a phenomenon uh, that we have seen in this country certainly um, that people light skinned black people are more highly valued than darker skinned black people. Why? Because they're more like white people. And so now I, I would hope none of you would defend that because it's really insidious. But I mean, this idea that some animals matter more than others because they're more like us is nonsense. As long as they're sentient, as long as they're subjectively aware, they have an interest in not suffering and they have an interest in their lives. As a matter of fact, the most the, the topic of my most recent book, uh, Why Veganism Matters, The Moral Value of Animals at Columbia University just published. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry? Yeah, we read about how oh, you read? Oh, did you really? I, I read it out loud. I'm getting static. I'm getting static. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you able to hear me? Oh, hmm. Does it sound any better now? Yes, it sounds. Now, now it sounds fine. Before, oh, it did not sound. Okay, yeah, it was a little unplugged, I think. All right. Okay. All right. Yes, so I was just saying we, we read a little bit of the book here, so uh, well, good, good. It's fantastic. I'm, it, it, I'm glad you like it. Um, but anyway, so um, so that's that's um, uh, uh, you know basically sentience is the only characteristic that matters. Cognitive characteristics don't matter. That that doesn't mean the cognitive characteristics are irrelevant. I mean, we pay brain surgeons more than we pay janitors. Now, maybe we ought not to do that. Maybe everybody ought to get paid the same. But you know, <laughs> it, it, it's it's that's general, most people don't think that but but um you know you can treat people differently let's let's assume that um you know the school wants to hire somebody who can teach mathematics to the students should they hire somebody who's good at mathematics or, or should they hire somebody who's mentally disabled and is not able to add 2 plus 2 well obviously you should hire the person who's good in mathematics if the question is who should you hire to teach mathematics you don't have to t treat two people who are not the same in the same way and say, well, we should give, you know, we should let, let the, do a coin flip and, and give the, give the person who wins the coin flip the job. That would be crazy. Um, but if the question is a different question, who should we use? The person who's good at mathematics or the person who is not good at, math, math, at mathematics and is mentally disabled, who should we use as a forced organ donor or as a non-consenting subject of a biomedical experiment? And the answer is you shouldn't use either of them because both of them are persons. They both have a morally significant interest in their lives. They're both sentient beings who have a morally significant interest in their lives. We shouldn't use either of them as things, as commodities, exclusively for the use of others. That doesn't mean we have to treat them the same. It means we have to treat them the same for the limited purpose of not treating either of them as things. The fifth principle is that all forms of discrimination are interrelated. You know, I, I, I started thinking about this back in the 1980s um, when, I, when I first got involved. And I, I thought the fur campaign was really horrible because it was really sexist. It still is, but it was really sexist back then. Um, and, you know, it, was, it, was, um, uh, it resulted in a lot of uh, really misogynistic and sexist behavior. And I started thinking, you know, there, all of this stuff is interrelated, and and you know speciesism is bad because it's like racism and sexism and heterosexism and all that other sort of stuff, and because it's an irrelevant criterion for determining who's a member of the moral community. Well, if you say that racism, that speciesism is bad because it's like racism or sexism, that means you've got a position on racism and sexism. 
And, right. you know, to say that, well, you know, we're animal people. We don't have a position on that. That's nonsense. Of course, we have a position on that. Racism is bad. Sexism is bad. And that doesn't mean you have to stop everything you're doing for animals and, and put all your time into, you know, anti-racism or anti-sexism. It means you want to live your life as an anti-racist. You want to live your life as an anti-sexist. And you want to support those positions to the extent that you're ever called on. And you ought not to engage in racist conduct or sexist conduct or, you know, heterosexist conduct, etc. All of this stuff is related. And, you know, it's all, it's all, it's all part of the same thing. You know, what we tend to do, we tend to draw these idiotic lines and then we stick, you know, we, 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 we draw a line and we say, okay, on this side are the beings who matter and on the other side are the beings who don't matter. And, and, and what we've done, if you look, for example, at the history of human discrimination, you see that we animalize. I mean, for example, look at, 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 uh, during the Second World War, um, where where the Nazis portrayed the Jews as rats, constant portrayals of the Jews as rats. So what they did was they animalized the Jews because then that sort of legitimized exterminating them. Think about what we do with women. Think about how we animalize. It's how we talk about women using all sorts of animal terms. Oh, this person's foxy. Oh, what a bitch. We use, we use animal terms. We animalize women. And then this justifies sexism and misogyny. We've got to see all this stuff is related. And we've got to reject it all. And the final principle of the abolitionist approach is it's nonviolent. Um, I am violently opposed to violence. I think that violence is the problem. It's not any part of the solution. If violence was a solution to any of the world's problems, we'd be living in the Garden of Eden right now. Because in case you haven't noticed, we the history of humankind, the history of humankind going way the hell back has been violence. And if violence worked, we'd be, we'd be grand now. But it doesn't. As a matter of fact, the world is world gets more and more violent as time goes on. Why? Because violence begets violence. And you know, I remember I remember once um, you know, being at a I was giving a lecture at a Canadian university, and somebody stood up and said, um, if a um if a vivisector is using 60 dogs a year, um it, it, is it okay to kill the vivisector? And I said, Let me ask you a question. Um I said, Are you a vegan? Yes. Is your mother a vegan? No. I said, well, what does your mother eat? My mother doesn't eat beef. My mother eats chicken. And I said, uh, does your mother eat chicken once a week? What does this have to do with my question? I said, just answer my question. Does your mother eat chicken more than once a week? Yeah. I said, your mother's responsible for a hell of a lot more than 60 deaths a year. Your mother's responsible for hundreds of deaths. Is it okay to kill your mother? And he said, well, there's a difference. And I said, no, there is no difference between your mother and the vivisector. We've got a society in which, you know, people engage in animal exploitation. It's what they do. And this idea that it's all right to use violence against animal exploiters is sort of crazy. I mean, put aside the moral question. It's, it's, it's a crazy idea because when 98% of the population out there is, 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 is eating animals, um, what does it mean to say it's all right to use violence against animal exploiters? I mean, I, I think that that's a. I think I think talking about using violence against them, I mean, you know, these 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 protests against slaughterhouse workers and things like that. Who the hell works in a slaughterhouse? That I mean, you know, you work in a slaughterhouse when you can't get a job doing anything else. You get work in a slaughterhouse when you're an illegal al- a- a- immigrant. That's when you work in a slaughterhouse. The people working in a slaughterhouse ain't the problem. You know, like the farmers, the farmers aren't the problem. The problem is the people out there who demand the price. I mean, people who talk about, oh, these factory farmers. Well, yes, of course, they're business people and they're going to do it as cheaply as they can. They're not the problem. The problem is the rest of us who demand this stuff. We've got to change the way we think about this. And you say, well, you know, but but how are we going to get the world to be vegan? Let me tell you something. If everybody who is vegan turned one other person vegan in the next year, just one. Just one, you know, such sight slow. If if everybody who's vegan turned one other person vegan in the following year, and then everybody did that the following year, then the following year, and the following year, the world would be vegan in about fifteen years. So I mean, the power of one should not be underestimated. We could have a vegan world if we wanted to. 
And it's another, yeah, yet another reason why I have problems with these groups, because these groups are busy telling people, no, you know, you can eat cage-free eggs or crate free pork. No, there ought to be one. Animal people, people who care about animal rights, should be pushing one line, veganism. That's all that matters. And that's the only thing that's ever going to change the world. That's like sort of in a capsule of like, a millionth of what I think about. Um, but it's, um, you know, <laughs> it's a limited time we have here today. So ask me questions. Yeah, that was, um, that was incredibly powerful. Everyone was, I think I speak for everyone here. That was amazing. Everyone really, really loved that. Uh, that was a fantastic speech. So now to get into some questions. All right. So um, are you familiar with antinatalism? You're talking about David Benatar? Yes. <laughs> it, 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 well, it, let me hold on a second, man. Hold on a second. On the back of my, <laughs> in the back of my most recent book, it says Gary L. Francione clearly and accessibly argues that veganism is a moral imperative. Why veganism matters advances our understanding of just how much animals are owed. David Benatar. Um, oh, yes, yes, I know, David. Yes, I know. Oh, I'm awesome. I'm that is so great. So, what do you think about? Antinatalism? What is your stance on it? And do you think vegans should be antinatalists? I think anybody who's sane should be an antinatalist. I mean, um, uh, look, we don't have kids. We don't have kids because and we've been together for a long time. And we didn't have kids because back then I thought, you know, things were getting pretty bad back then. And now I look back and I say, geez, you know, Richard Nixon wasn't really all that bad a guy. Um, and, and, um, things have gotten a hell of a lot worse. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine, I do not understand, to be honest with you, I don't understand why anybody is having children in 2022. Um, global warming is a major problem. Anybody, if you're, if you're bringing another human into the world right now, then, you know, in 20 or 30 years, if this nonsense continues, it's going to be unbearable. I mean, you know, I'm, I look at it and say, you know, I, I'll be dead or close to. I mean, I'll, I'll probably be dead then. But, but you know, so in certain ways, it's not going to matter to me. But, um, but to, to the rest of you, I mean, like, how can you even think about having kids? I mean, what is the? You're bringing people into existence in a in a an inherently precarious situation, and in a situation where they're going to be a drain on resources too. And 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 you know, so so should we be doing that? You know. I, I I really I just I think that there are some really powerful arguments for not having kids. I really do. I think there's some very you know you want to have a kid, adopt one. You know that's that's my that's my, my general thing is you want a dog, go to a shelter. You want a kid, go to an orphanage. Um, and and you know this idea of making more um, children. There are kids who don't have homes now. Why that? Why go out and 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 make more people. I mean, love is not a matter of biology. It's a matter of your heart. And, and, and so, you know, I don't get it. I, I don't, I just don't get it. And every time, you know, one of my students tells me, oh, you know, I'm going to have a baby. And so, I, I, you know, you want to, you don't want to be a downer and say, well, you know, that's terrible, but I don't, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Um, and so, yeah, I do think there are, I think David's book, I don't know if you've ever read his book, um, but it's, yeah, it's, yeah, I have. it's a, it's a really, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, um, I mean, I'm not sure that I would take it quite as far. I mean, um, I mean, David's, David's argument is that, that, you know, life, even if it's good for you still has an enormous amount of pain and suffering. Well, the fact that most of us don't kill ourselves is an indication that we make these, these, you know, we make these assessments of balance, but I do think that there are really important, really good uh, consequential reasons for not bringing any more people into existence, at least not now. And I really say the same thing to, you know, all of you who are thinking of having kids. I, I say the same thing to you. I would say if you said, you know, I'd really like to have a cat or a dog or a rabbit, I'd say go to a shelter, never go to a breeder, you know, go to a shelter and adopt. And I would say the same thing to you. If you want a kid, go to, you know, there's a lot of kids out there who need homes. Go out there and give them a home. Gotcha. Fantastic. Um, well, I guess this will lead quickly. I had a quick question. So um, consequentialism in general, right? <clears throat> um, the way that you oftentimes speak, it, um, 
you know, regarding your uh, full abolitionist position, it comes across a little bit uh, sort of deontic to me. Um, but it a seems you got sympathized. A little bit, a little bit yeah, a little bit deontic. <laughs> Okay, I, I was well. Okay, I didn't want to. I didn't want to because you seem to really enjoy Benatar's book, and you know, very consequentialist over there. So, um, yeah, basically, I was wondering what your thoughts are on consequentialists and uh, utilitarian approaches to animal ethics. Generally. Well, I, I think I think utilitarian approaches to any issues of fundamental rights is a disaster. It's a complete mm -hmm. disaster because, because you know the history of humankind is littered with really bad, you know, bad situations of, well, I mean, look at what's going on right now. You've got, you know, you've got Vladimir Putin sitting there thinking, well, you know, the ends justify the means. And so I can like wipe out, um, you know, a zillion Ukrainians and I can rebuild, you know, the, the, the former, so, you know, Soviet, uh, whatever the hell he wants to do. But I mean, this is the problem. The problem is, you know, that, that when you're talking about fundamental rights, Consequentialism is, a, consequentialism is a disaster. I mean, you can't eliminate consequential thinking from humankind because, you know, for example, when Congress is figuring out how to spend money, um, they have to sort of look at, well, you know, how will the money, you know, what, what, what sorts of things will will what sorts of interests will best be advanced by by our spending this money or you know in this way or that way? You have to look at consequences in certain ways, but but to to say that that consequences determine who matters morally in terms of who is a thing and who is not a thing. So you say, well, the consequences of slavery are such that we can justify slavery. The consequences of animal exploitation is such that we can justify the consequence, we can justify animal exploitation. I think it's a disaster. And, and so, uh, you know, I do think that, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, look, I mean, it, uh, look at Peter Singer's philosophy. I mean, it. I think it's a uh, it's a disaster. It's a disaster because he's saying, well, you know, animals matter, but humans matter more. And you got to weigh this and you got to weigh that. And basically, he gives you a framework in which you can justify just about anything. And so that that's the problem with with utilitarianism. So I'm I'm a look. A right is simply a way of protecting an interest. That's all a right is. There's nothing, there's nothing magical about it. To say that I have a right of free speech is to say that my interest in expressing myself will be protected even if uh, people don't like what I say, if the consequences of what I say are negative and that people are unhappy with what I say, my interests are still going to be protected. I have a right. That's all a right is. It's a way of protecting an interest. And, and so I think that we can't, we can't start using consequences to decide who gets treated as a thing and who doesn't get treated as a thing. Because the bottom line is, is that the interests of the beings who are, you know, you, you're never going to have slavery or animal use where the principle of equal consideration is, is respected. Because the interests of slaves and the interests of animals and the interests of, you know, whatever disenfranchised group or, or, or you know, whatever group, those, those groups are always going to have their interests weighed less. They'll never win. And that's the problem. I mean, that's the that's I mean that that's the problem. Um, you know, I mean, when Singer talks about applying the principle of equal consideration to animals, I I had I, I you know years ago I was having dinner with him in New York City, and we, we talked about this, and I don't think he understood it then, and I don't think he understands it now. Um, he talks about applying the principle of equal consideration to animals. You can apply the principle of equal consideration to animals because they're property. Their interests are always going to be weighed less or else you're not going to have institutionalized animal use. Their, their interests are always going to have to, to be accorded a lower value. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of consequentialism when it comes to um, – Looking at issues of fundamental rights, you can't get rid of consequentialism altogether because you have to say, well, you know, uh, I've got ten dollars to spend. Should I spend it on, you know, this, 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 or that? And I have to look at, you know, what, what, you know, what, what things will happen if I spend it, you know, the ten dollars here, and what happens, what will happen if I spend the ten dollars there? I'd look at the consequences. I make a decision. But I'm talking about consequentialism when it, when it, when we're we're saying who is a member of the moral community, who gets treated as a thing. And who gets treated as a person with a morally significant interest in their lives? Then I'm not in favor of consequentialism. All right, fantastic. Um, so now we're going to have an audience member come up and ask the next question, real quick. And there they are. Hi, Gary. It's really, really nice to talk to you. Um, 
Yeah, I've actually I've used you to to teach quite a bit both on this Discord platform and also uh, at the university that I help out at. So it's really really nice to finally talk to you. Uh, before I start, I, I just want to mention that one of the things that I really appreciate about you in particular is that you frequently talk about or uh, give dedications to your companion animals, which is sometimes missing even within the animal rights literature. And so I hope that I I don't know if these are all of your companion animals, but I hope that Bandit, Stratton, Emma. Tedwin and Robert and any others are are doing great, and I'm I'm glad that they have you in their life. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, they're all dead. That's an old book. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was gonna say it's it's been a long time, and I've I've never I've never followed up on if there are, are new ones or others. But it's it's always great when um, I see I see academic writers citing their companion animals or using them in particular in their writing. So I'm sorry to bring up any bad memories if that was the case. But. Oh no 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 no! I have nothing but I have nothing. Look. You know, I have a weird, I, I have a problematic, or at least for many people, a problematic view about domestication. I don't think we should have domesticated mm-hmm. animals at all. In my perfect world, there are no domesticated animals. And so I love my dogs, but you know what? I, and you will not find anybody on the planet who loves hanging out with dogs more than Anna and me. We love the dogs. And you know what? If there were two dogs left and it were up to us as to whether... Um, uh, uh, they bred so that we could continue to have pets. Um, the answer is not on your life. Anna, I'm speaking for you. Is that okay? Anna, Anna said that's okay. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, the, bot- bot- the bottom line is that domestication is wrong. I mean, this idea that we bring these beings into existence who are who are submissive and subservient. Um, is you know, and, and and that's why we like them. We like them because they're they're submissive and subservient, and and that's really bad. We got to take care of the ones who are here now, but we are not to bring more into existence. I love my dogs, um, but they are my property. The whole situation sucks. It's wrong. Domestication is yeah. itself wrong. It ought to end. Yeah, I think actually, surprisingly, this this particular community shares a lot of those views. Um, but yeah, it's, I just wanted to to give them a shout out. Um, but the, the questions in particular I had actually were yep. related to law. And one thing that I'll mention too before I say that is actually that we we have a community here of either people who are lawyers, are studying to be lawyers, lawyers. Or, um, yeah. or or who are at least interested in law. And many of us credit that in part to, to you. So oh, I God. think it's worth also that you, that you've, you've, you've encouraged a lot of people to get into the field. Um, well, let, let me, let me, thank you. Thank you for, but let me, let me, in my defense, let me say something here. I, I when we ran uh, animal law, you know, is things like, you know, how to, how to do wills and trusts for, you know, your, you know, how to make sure your dogs and cats are taken care of, you know, when you die and how to deal with situations where people get divorced, who gets the dog, who gets the cat, who get, you know, you have visitation rights and all that sort of stuff. Um, and anti cruelty cases and stuff. I think that's nonsense. I don't. I don't think that does a damn. I mean, you know, I just I taught I taught uh, animal law last semester, and it hasn't gotten any better. You know, I mean, it's 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 it. Animal law mostly deals with property regulation because animals are property. So you know, you're dealing with how do you deal with this particular species of property? So should you give people more damages when veterinarians negligently injure a cat or dog? Should people get more damage, more, more, more uh, money in damages than the animal is worth in market value because of the emotional attachment, blah, blah, blah. I don't particularly find those, those issues all that terribly exciting. Um, when I ran, when Anna and I ran the clinic in the 1990s, we focused on human rights issues. We did things like prisoners who didn't, who were in, you know, who were in prison and didn't want to, you know, eat, eat animal products. They wanted vegan food. They couldn't, you know, you can get, you can get drugs in prison fat easier than you can get vegan food. Wow. And, um, and, and, you know, and we, we represented students that didn't want to dissect their vivisect, but those were all human rights issues. It was like, you know, students who didn't want to dissect their vivisect, um, prisoners who wanted vegan food, people who got in trouble criminally, stuff like that. We represented those. Those were human rights issues. They just happened to involve animal animal things. So it's look. The reality is, as long as animals are property, the legal system is going to do nothing. It, it, it's it, it's going to be largely useless um, to do anything because you know it's it's like it's like you know 
Animals are property. So what you're going to end up doing is having discussions about property values. And if that's what turns you on, that's great. I mean, I, I, I would rather be dead, but, um, you know, but I understand. I mean, I just, I did a, a conference a few weeks ago with a bunch of people from the Animal Legal Defense Fund and I was listening to them speak and I was thinking, if I did that stuff all day, I would, I would, Probably not be happy um, because, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't really get excited about, you know, who who gets, you know, about divorce situations where, you know, they're when there are settlement issues about, you know, who gets the dog, who gets the cat and other vis visitation rights, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that just sort of thing is not going to change the world. What's going to change the world is a vegan. We need a vegan movement. And I came to see this, you know, after I was practicing animal law for years, knocking my head against the wall. And and realizing that the system, you know, the, the system is there to protect property interests. I mean, you know, if you're a law student or a lawyer, you know, law school is like a three year course in property law. That's really what it is. I mean, that's what you were focusing on. Most of the time we're focusing on property issues. We're never going to change the world. You know, lawyers, law doesn't change things. What happens is society changes and then the law follows. We need to change the thinking, the moral thinking about animals. Then the law might be able to be used in, in useful ways. But as a general matter, what is the, I mean, you know, what is the law doing that's all that terribly interesting? I mean, right now, the, the, the big excitement is on these ag-gag laws. Well, I, let me give you my cut on the ag-gag laws. I, as, a, as, a, as somebody who, you know, takes constitutional law seriously, I, I think ag-gag is a terrible idea because it's, it's, it's regulating speech substantively. And I always think that's a bad idea, whether it's about animals or about widgets or anything else. But, the, you know, the whole ag, the whole motivation behind ag-gag is, these organizations, whether it's Mercy for Animals or Compassion Over Killing or PETA or any of these other groups, they, they want to get they want to have campaigns. And what they want to do is they want to get people in these places, whether they're slaughterhouses or farms, and they want to get them wired up with cameras and they want to get them photographing bad stuff. Well, you know, and then they want to have they want to produce a campaign to get people to say, we've got to get rid of that abuse. I disagree with that. My view is, is I don't really care about the factory farm, family farm, whatever sort of farm, they all end up dead. And I think it's a really bad idea, a really super bad idea to get people to think that the problem is the abuse of the factory farm or the abuse in the particular slaughterhouse. There is no such thing. I don't know how many slaughterhouses you've been in in your life, but I can tell you this, a slaughterhouse that is operating by the book, by the regulation, completely in accordance with law is a nightmare. And so the idea that, you know, that that's the problem I have um, is that, you know, animal law is doesn't really move the ball ahead very far. Thank you so much for answering the question. Thank you for asking it. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Well, that wasn't the question. We actually haven't gotten to the question yet. Oh, yeah, wait, that wasn't even the question. I think the question is worth asking. I think, I think the question is, is worth asking anyways, nice. because it's a continuation from that, perhaps. Um, so one of, one of the lawyers who wanted to ask, in particular, if you have a way that you see the abolition of this commodity status happening in Commonwealth countries, and, and as an extension of that, what you think that a postgraduate law student should focus on in their studies if they meaningfully want to contribute to this goal of having non-human animals not be classified as property. Help people, help people who want to do vegan activism, for example, if they, you know, I mean, help, help vegans do vegan activism. Use your legal skills to help vegans do vegan activism. That's important. Be a vegan yourself. Educate everybody you can about veganism. And Will we ever get rid of the property status of animals? Well, not as long as most people are eating them. I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, you, you can't get rid of a practice that most people participate in. You just can't do it, right? And and so as long as people are, I believe we could get rid of the property status of animals, but it requires that we have a paradigm shift and that we stop thinking about animals as things that we can use. And, you know, that goes back to the 19th century when, when, you know, in Britain, they started the animal welfare movement and they said, ah, oh, animals have an interest in suffering. You know, that's all that matters is they can suffer. So therefore we have to make sure that they don't suffer. 
But what happened was there was a bifurcation. It was a separation of the interest and not suffering from the interest in continuing to live. And so we recognize that animals had an interest in not suffering, but we said that because they're not like us mentally, because they don't, they're not self-aware, they can't recognize themselves in mirrors or whatever the hell the problem is, they don't have an interest in continuing to live. And so it's all right for us to use and kill them. We need to rethink that. That's the point of my, of my most recent book um, that, uh, that apparently a number of you have sat through reading of half of, um, but, but, um, I hope you read the good half, Paki. I hope you read the good half. Uh, but, oh, I did. <laughs> uh, although it's hard to know, it's also also good. Um, but the the thing is, is that is that um, until we get rid of that thinking where we bifurcate the interest in, if you can suffer, then you have an interest in continuing to live. That's the argument that I make, and and we need to sort of get away from this idea that using and killing animals is okay under any circumstance. It ain't. Um, and, 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 um, and so I do think we can change things. I mean, remember something does, if you had 10% of a population, it was a great study done some years ago by some guys at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute up in upstate New York. And, um, they said that if you have 10% of a population that really believes strongly in an idea, it creates tremendous change in the society. If you had 10% of our population committed to abolitionist veganism, none of this meatless Monday nonsense, none of this, you know, veganuary nonsense, but basically who embraced veganism as a moral imperative, if you had 10% of the population, it would start a new discussion. We would be talking about using animals. We don't talk about using animals now. We talk about how we treat animals. That's the wrong question. We ought to be thinking about how we use animals and whether we can justify using animals. And, and we don't have those discussions. We're too busy talking about factory farming. I mean, look, look, what is the issue that all the groups talk about now? Factory farming. You know, oh, factory farming. Factory farming is terrible. This factory farming, factory farming. That's the wrong issue. Factory farming is terrible, but trying to make it better, it's never going to work anyway. And it's still going to leave you with a lot of dead animals. And so I, I really think, yeah, we could change things. And, and, you know, but if you're a lawyer, my view is spend your time trying to work in identifying issues where people who are trying to abolish animal exploitation need help, whether they're people who are, I mean, for example, we used to do a lot of stuff where vegans were wanting to have uh, uh, demonstrations or some event, and they couldn't because the cops were trying to charge them $500 for a permit or some nonsense like that. And so, you know, we were there, we were, you know, we were there promoting their, their, you know, their, their interests and stuff, but, but that was their speech rights as vegans. We were defending that. I never did. And, and would, I never did things like drafting wills for, you know, or to set up trust accounts for dogs or cats. I didn't, I never did that. I never did divorce cases um, where people were fighting about who got custody of Fido. I never did that sort of stuff. Um, I, you know, we represented, you know, we, we, I, did, I remember we did a case where there was a dog on death row and um, dog had, been, had bitten a kid and the, the, the dog was, there was a dangerous dog law, there still is in New Jersey, and they were going to kill the dog. And we got involved and I took that case because it allowed me to go on television 85,000 times and say, yes, this dog should not be killed. But people, you know, if you care about this dog, I need to ask you a further question. Why aren't you vegan? Because what's the difference between this dog that you all are upset about being killed by the state of New Jersey and the chicken that you ate tonight at dinner while you were sitting around talking about how this dog should be killed. And so, you know, I, I, I think there's, we as lawyers can do a lot. The problem is, is that the animal legal defense fund approach is never going to, you know, is, is never going to get anywhere. You know, the, the, the idea about, you know, um, uh, being zero tolerance of cruelty. Well, what, it, what does that even mean? I mean, if they're not promoting veganism, what is the point? Um, and, and, you know, I mean, they talk about, you know, people who are cruel to animals. Well, I have news for you. Um, you know, the animals that people eat, will eat tonight, um, you know, at dinner will have been treated far more cruelly than most of the cruelty cases that, that are being featured by some of these animal law organizations. Awesome. Thank you very much for your responses. You. They're really, really informative. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Fantastic. 
So our next question comes um, from Allison Augusto. Um, what do you think about wild animal suffering? Should we interfere in nature to save animals from natural disasters? And I'll add on top of that from like predation from other animals and stuff. The history of humans interfering with the environment is not a good one. Um, <laughs> right. uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think, you know, maybe, maybe my, maybe my horizons are limited, but my view is, is that, um, uh, I really don't think we should, I think we should leave them alone is what I think we should do, because I think it's very difficult to start messing around. I mean, having said that, when I finish with you all today, I will go out and put my 15 pounds of carrots out for the deer, um, uh -huh. but, um, you know, which I do. Uh, but, um, but I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I've had this argument. I mean, I, I've this. I've asked this question has been asked of me many, many times over the years. Do I think we should get involved? I would certainly, um, if if an animal was harming another animal, I would probably stop the animal from harming the other animal. But that wouldn't. That would be an aesthetic reaction on my part. The animal who's doing the harming is not making a moral decision, and animals who are carnivores have to eat. And so, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I just, I just think, I, I think it's too. Con I, I really think the idea of intervening in nature is um, fraught with all sorts of hazards, and it's the sort of quite, it's the sort of thing where if I live to be four hundred years old and I see a vegan world, then maybe I'll start worrying about that question. But right now, I'm trying to, de I'm dealing with a world in which. People are harming animals, 80 billion land animals and a trillion sea animals, totaling more than the number of human beings who have ever lived on the planet from when we crawled out of the swamp every year uh, for food, when that is completely unnecessary. Indeed, it's, 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 I mean, the fact that we eat animals and that we're, we're siphoning off all the grain um, you know, in the United States alone, I mean, you know, people, even if you don't care about animals, in this country alone, we're eating, enough, you know, we feed enough grain to animals that we're going to use for food. We could feed 800 million people. I mean, you know, the, it's mind boggling. And so I just, I worry about, you know, that's what I focus on. And I really think that we got to leave um, non-domesticated animals alone. Um, and, and, um, you know, uh, we just, just ought to leave them alone and starting to intervene in their environments, um, is a really bad, bad idea. I really think we ought to avoid it. All right. Thanks so much for that answer. Um, next question is from kid. Should abolitionist vegans sign petitions for welfare reforms, given that it takes so little a time and wouldn't take energy away from abolitionist activism and could potentially help improve the lives of non-human animals. No. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. no, you shouldn't sign. You shouldn't sign those things. Um, because uh, you can say, well, they don't, they don't take any time. Well, it's true. They don't take any time. Um, but what they do is they perpetuate this idea that welfare reform is a good idea. You don't want to be perpetuating the idea that welfare reform is a good idea. And when you say that, well, but, um, uh, um, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it helps, it helps stop suffering. No, it doesn't. I mean, these, these welfare reform measures are, to call them bullshit is really an insult to bulls um they they're completely useless they don't do anything um you know they really just don't do anything um and what they end up doing is increasing suffering because i go back to my my something i said an hour ago and that is welfare reform has the effect of making people think that it's okay to use animals and and that you know it, it it tells them that there's a right way to do the wrong thing. I think that's a disaster. I really do think that's a disaster. I think I think a lot of people that I've encountered in my life wouldn't be eating animals at all if they understood that the most humanely produced animal products involve torture. <laughs> Bottom line, that's what it does. 
Um, and they just don't understand that. And in part because they listen to these groups, you know, I mean, I mean, for example, I remember a few years ago, Mercy for Animals had this ridiculous campaign where they were, they were, you know, um, uh, you know, experiencing institutional orgasms over the idea that, 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 uh, what's it, what, uh, Walmart, well, I think it was Walmart, Walmart, one of the chains was going to like start selling cage-free eggs, you know, 30% of their eggs would be cage-free by, you know, the year 2097. I mean, it was like, it was it, it, this sort of, and, and so you end up, you end up sort of praising Walmart and saying, oh, Walmart cares about animal welfare. Well, what does that do? It gets people to go to, when they go to Walmart, they go and they buy animal products saying, I feel better about buying animal products in, in, in Walmart because, because they're they're being produced more humanely. That's wrong. That's that is a very very bad idea. Um, I would like to, the only petition that I can see signing is a petition against animal welfare petitions. We should have a <laughs> we should have a petition against animal welfare petitions because they are horrible. I mean, you know, I right before this thing started, I was in the in the other room making some tea, and. Um, and there was a commercial from the ASPCA on. And I have to tell you, it's about as obscene as I could possibly. I mean, it's like a bunch, it's like sad music and a bunch of puppies, pi- pictures of puppies. And it's, it's, you know, an animal suffering, you know, animal hunger causes the animals to suffer. And we need your $19 a month, you know, so that we can feed these animals. And if you do this, you know, you'll save a life and we'll give you a t-shirt. And I was thinking, wow, that is really horrible because, you know, what about the, all the animals that, you know, that people are eating. Um, and, you know, and while the ASPCA is doing is trying to sort of, you know, in the ASPCA, the guy who heads the ASPCA, the last time I checked, he was making 780000 some huge amount of money for salary, make a lot of money. And, um, uh, and those are all animal dollars. Those are all contributed for animals. And, um, and, and I think that, that, you know, this sort of stuff and this idea, this this thing, you become an animal person if you care about these starving puppies and you send this multi-zillion dollar organization yet more money and you'll get your t-shirt. This is the wrong way to be thinking. We've got to get away from this. Stop eating them, wearing them, using them. Educate yourself so you can talk to some people about veganism and don't let a day go by without talking to somebody. I'm telling you, not only do I do these sorts of things, not only do I teach, but I have conversations with people in the supermarket like all the time. I mean, I have conversations with anybody who stands still long enough. If I have my dogs in the car and because I love my dogs love to take rides. So, we, you know, I put them in the car and we, we drive around. And, and if somebody sees my dogs and they come up and they say, oh, you know, and I tell them the story about the dogs. And this one was this one was terrible, you know, was abused in this way. That was abused in that way. And then I always get into how much we love our animals, but how, how we eat them. And that, that just doesn't make any sense. I talk to people about these sorts of things all the time. And I mean, people see that I got 12 heads of kale in my in my, in my, um, I eat a huge amount of kale and they'll see that I've got a lot of kale in my, my shopping basket. And they'll say, do you run a restaurant? And I say, no, I'm just a vegan. I eat all this stuff. And then they say, oh, you're a vegan. And then, you know, they ask, you know, it's always followed by, but where do you get your protein? And I, I never get upset with people. I never, even though they ask me the same question 14 million times a month, I always act like it's the first time I've ever heard and say, well, you know, it's really easy. You know, it's easy to get your protein. It's easy to get all your nutritional requirements. But, you know, that's what you, that's what you, you want to change the world. It's a lot of hard work, um, but it, we could do it. That's what breaks my heart is that we could do it. We could do it if we wanted, but instead what we do is we, we hand it all over to these organizations who are, ba- which are basically businesses. I don't, I mean, you know, they're all, these, they're, these charities are all businesses, and they all take, they all have to take a moderate position. They don't take, ask yourself a question. Why is it that no organization in this country takes the position that veganism is a moral imperative? Why do they all support various welfare reforms and various single issue campaigns? And the answer is, it's business. That's what you got to do. If you want to keep those dollars coming in, you can't tell people you got to be a vegan or else you're an animal exploiter. Um, because people aren't going to give you money if you say that. That's the nice thing. I don't, I don't worry about that. I don't run an organization. Gotcha. You know, I don't run an organization. I tell people all the time, if you're, if you're eating animals, you're part of the problem. 
And, you know, you don't have to say that in a way that offends them, but, you know, you can, you can, uh, I'm honest with them. Awesome. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, our next question, I believe, is coming from, oh, well, <laughs> never mind. I think you've already answered this more than enough times. <laughs> it was going to be about the incrementalist approach to convincing people about animals, like be January and Meatless Mondays. But <laughs> I think we know what you're going to say there. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just say this to you, though. All right. You know, all right. If, if somebody says to me, this because this happens with, you know, um, so I, the question I get asked a lot is, well, if somebody says I'm not ready to go vegan, isn't it a good idea to, to tell them to be incremental? And I, I, I always answer the same way. And I say, look, if I'm talking to somebody and that person says, I'm not willing to go vegan right away. I try, I try to explain to them. You know, I mean, it's like I, 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 depending on how much time I have and what the context is, I will say to the person, look, you know, what are your questions? What are your issues? Let's talk about it. Uh, well, I'm not worried about the nutrition. Don't worry about it. You can learn everything you need to know about nutrition in two hours if you're a slow, slow reader. I mean, you really can. It's not really complicated. And um, and and um, you know, but but the bottom line is, is if you think it's wrong to eat animals, but you're not willing to to go vegan, then you should do whatever you're going to do. Because I'm not going to give. I'm not going to put a stamp of approval on it and say, "Well, it's a good idea if you, you know, if you become a reducitarian or if you eat cage-free eggs or crate-free pork." Because then, what I'm telling them is that that's a morally okay thing to do, and it's not. It's not okay. And so, you know, this idea that, you know, and one of the things I really don't, I don't, I, I, I react very badly is this idea that, well, by telling people that if they're not vegans, they're engaging in exploiting animals is shaming them. I don't even understand what the hell that means. That's like saying, I mean, is it shaming people? If somebody's engaging in racist behavior, is it shaming them to say, you really shouldn't do that? That's racist. You shouldn't engage in racism. And the answer is, if that's where we are as a society, then we're in big trouble because we've got to be clear about fundamental rights. And we've got to be clear. We've got to be crystal clear. We've got, I mean, I, I say to people all the time, look, I'm sure you're a nice person. The bottom line is if you are, if you say you care about animals and you are eating animals, then you, you need to understand what caring about means. And you have to understand what, what your actions are saying about what you really think about the moral value of animals. You think they are things. You can say what you want, but your actions are saying something else. And for somebody to say, well, but you're shaming that person, he says, no, I'm informing that person. If you wish to characterize that as shaming, then you do that. But I'm informing that person of what that person is as a matter of fact doing. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All right. So question from Sub-Zero. Are you categorically opposed to using unlawful tactics to liberate animals, even if they could be effective? Or do you accept that they can sometimes be legitimate and right? I think as a strategy, as a, as a strategy for movement change, it makes no sense whatsoever. Because, look, you take... You take ten animals, they get replaced, right? I mean, you know, you could burn down, you could burn down ten slaughterhouses right now, and and if the demand is still there, ten more are going to spring up tomorrow, or ten more existing ones are going to pr increase production capacity. So, I mean, it's it's it, as a strategy, um, you know, as a strategy, it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, you know, to, to, to say that well, what we want to do is liberate these animals. The answer is, you, can, you know, I mean, I've, I've never understood these liberate. Well, I understand them. I mean, these liberation efforts where, you know, you get a quote liberation and then a video gets, gets put out showing the animals, you know, you know, running in the fields or something that's for fundraising purposes because you're putting those animals at risk. Um, by saying the animals have been taken and by showing them in some context that somebody might recognize where they are and you're putting them at risk. So, I mean, I just don't understand the whole strategy of saying, well, what we want to do, you know, we're, that animal liberation becomes, you know, or whatever the hell you want to call it, becomes a strategy. The answer is no, it doesn't. Because if, if it, 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 you take 10 animals, they get replaced. <clears throat> you shut down one place, you shut down one place, another place opens up. As long as the demand is there, people have got to understand something. The farmers and the slaughterhouses and all the other all the other aspects of institutionalized exploitation, they're not the primary problem. The primary problem 
is the consumer who demands the stuff. Us, all of us. You know, I I posted something on um, my Twitter page and actually on the Facebook page today um, about Joanne Lumley, who's a who's a British actress, and um, she was uh, in a very popular sitcom called Absolutely Fa- a- Absolutely Fabulous, and um, uh, and she she was she was in Britain giving a talk on behalf of compassion and uh, compassion and world farming, and. Um, uh, which is one of the worst organizations. I mean, they, they promote happy exploitation. They they give awards to people who who use cage free eggs or enriched eggs. They give it's, it's a dreadful organization. And she says she, she says she's not a vegan, um, but you know she's she's moving in that direction. But she's not a vegan. But she thinks that farmers are responsible for suffering. What nonsense! Of course they're responsible for suffering in one sense. We're all responsible. But the bottom line is, is the farmers are are satisfying a demand. They're they're there satisfying a demand that we, including Joanna Lumley, who's not a vegan, create. And the 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 you know and and that groups like Compassion and World Farming create by telling people that they can be happy. You know that they can be they can re- receive awards from Compassion and World Farming if they. Um, you know, if they serve only, you know, compassionate eggs or compassionate pork or whatever the hell they're, they're talking about. I mean, and, and so that's the problem is that we're thinking about this in a completely confused way. We're the problem. We, all of us, are the problem. We've got to stop thinking of the enemy. The enemy is us. You know, I mean, the enemy is us. The enemy is our, our, our anthropocentrism, our speciesism, and our selfishness. Wow. Yeah. That was yeah. That was I agree with all of that. I have to I have to tell you, I know I know like every year I get I get a fair amount of crap because um, when Peter puts out its poster of Paul McCartney, um, you know, saying something <clears throat> saying something or other, I always say Paul McCartney is not a vegan. I'm not interested in the damn thing he has to say. He's been a vegetarian for longer than I've been alive, and he's you know he's still not a vegan. And we got to hear we got to have Peter telling us. That you know, people ought to listen to Paul McCartney. No, Paul McCartney is not a vegan. He is he is in choosing to continue to exploit animals. I don't know what economic relationship he has with Linda McCartney's uh, food line. Um, you know, but but that's certainly not vegan. Um, and and so you know, it it it's it. Uh, people need to understand. You know, I mean, if if you're not a vegan and you're talking about you know animal exploiters, you're talking about yourself. And I think it's really important that we sort of get away from this idea that, well, you know, there's a there's a, there's a right way to, you know, that we got to stop this. I mean, it's like Ricky Gervais. You know, I get a lot of crap whenever I criticize him, too, because, um, you know, as far as I know, I mean, he's not a vegan. Um, and for years he hasn't been a vegan. But yet he talks about how people abuse animals. Well, if you're eating animals, you're abusing them because there is no use that is not abuse. So I think it's just we've got to be clear about this stuff. All right, fantastic. Um, I think now we are going to have another person come up, Bully Vegan, if you are here, which I am unsure about. If not, oh, there you are, perfect. Bully Vegan, are you there? Ah, there you are. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think I can hear you. Can you hear me right here? Oh, I think I know what's going on. Hold on. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, my question would be, uh, for, for, first, uh, thank you for being here. I found this uh, conversation very insightful. My question would be, uh, what is your thought on intersectional veganism? Do you think it uh, weakens the strength of the animal rights movement? It depends what you mean by intersectional veganism, because intersectionality is a concept that is, there's a lot of confusion about it. When Kim Crenshaw used the expression intersectionality uh, a, few, a few years back, what she was doing was referring to the fact that, and the context that she gave was that she said a black woman is discriminated as both a black person and a woman. So, you know, True. when she when she was talking about intersectionality, she was talking about how the fact that if you participate in different groups, you're, you're, you suffer the discrimination. So if you're a black gay woman, 
uh, then you're discriminated against as a black, you're discriminated against as a woman, and you're discriminated against as a gay person. So um, now what intersectionality has come to mean is the idea, well, I, I, intersectionality means a couple of things. To the extent that it means that we ought to eliminate discrimination against everybody because it's all related, I not only think that that does not weaken the movement, I think that that strengthens the movement um, because it, 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 it makes clear that um, all, all of this sort of thinking is related. What I think is problem, problematic with what gets identified as intersectional veganism is this idea, for example, some years ago, I had a real uh, exchange with a group of folks, um, uh, one of whom was uh, Breeze Harper, who uh, accused me of being racist because I said that um, veganism is a moral baseline for everybody. And whether you're rich or poor or black or white or, you know, or on Mars or whatever, it's ba the bottom line is just as um, killing humans without provocation is wrong, um, killing animals without, if you're not being attacked by some, some cow or something, um, you can't justify killing, killing the animal. And there was some argument about, well, but if you're, if you're a person for whom culturally, animal exploitation is really important, then it's all right for you. And I don't agree with that at all. I mean, uh, everything, everything that, that is bad in the world is part of somebody's culture. And so I don't know. I don't, I just don't get this idea that people get excuses because, um, you know, it's part of their culture. I don't care if it's part of your culture. I mean, Female genital mutilation is part of people's culture. Does that make it okay because it's part of people's culture? I don't really – I'm not a cultural relativist. Uh, I'm not a moral relativist at all. As, as Pake had said before, I am somewhat deontic. That was called a, 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 grotesque, under, under, <laughs> under, a grotesque understatement. But um, I'm, not, I'm, not a moral, I'm not a moral relativist at all. Um, and so, um, I don't believe in moral relativism and I think that it's, I think female genital mutilation is wrong. Absolutely. I don't really care whether it, whether it's part of someone's culture. I think that animal exploitation is wrong. I don't care whether it's part of someone's culture. By the way, sexism is part of just about everybody's culture and has been for like a trillion and a half years. So what? Doesn't make, doesn't mean it's okay because it's, it's because sexism is cultural. Um, it, it means we've got to work even harder to get rid of it because it's pervasive. Uh, I don't, I mean, I've been, you know, some, some months ago, uh, maybe when the Black Lives Matter thing started, I had a Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, 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 statement on my page and I got a bunch of people from Anonymous for the Voiceless who came on my page and they were upset about that because they said, really? That, yeah. 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 They were really, they were really upset about it. And they said, um, they said that I needed to rethink my position. Good luck with that. And um, and and they they said because um, we need a movement where um, I I, I want to. This is not a direct quote, but this is similar. It's it, it, it. I don't have the it in front of me, so I can't quote it. But the sense of it was: we need to have a movement that has left and right. And, and has feminists and members of the men's rights movement marching alongside each other. And, and I said, um, I don't really see this as anything but a movement, a progressive movement, and I don't really want any men's rights movement people anywhere near me, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, uh, and I mean, the whole world is one big men's rights movement, isn't it? But, but um, uh, and so I, I think, I mean, this, it, the, the idea there is that if we take a position that discrimination is wrong, we're going to piss off the people who are in favor of discrimination. Well, I guess that's true. Um, but you know, you're going to, if you, if you take a position that discrimination is wrong, you're going to piss off the right wing people who, who think discrimination is just grand. I'm not, I don't really care about, about pissing them off. I have to tell you, <laughs> it's just not a matter of concern. I, I think we ought to say what's right and animal exploitation is wrong. And, and treating humans as means to ends is also wrong, and we ought to ought to be clear about that. And if and if uh, if the alternative is 
you either stop saying that, you know, you have to stop saying that because it's going to upset people who think that exploiting humans is, is, you know, I mean, you know, if my saying that, that, you know, the, because, because I also got in trouble with a bunch of activists uh, a couple years ago because they, they had some event in New York City and where they were protesting fur. And I believe Kim Kardashian or one of these people was there and they were, they said all these sexist things are, and I'm not, I'm not trying to defend Kim Kardashian or any of these people. I don't really care about them. I mean, you know, in terms of who, they're not my focus. My focus is I really hate it when animal people are there calling women bitches because they're wearing fur. I think that's a very, very, very wrong yeah. thing to do. And, and so I got this, I got this crap saying, well, you know, you care more about humans than animals because, and no, it's not that I care more. It's, it's, I don't think we should be calling women bitches. I think this is a really bad idea for lots of reasons. And if you'd like, I can explain them to you, but I think it's a really bad idea. But this idea that, that we're going to alienate people because, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm, that I'm going to alienate people who want to call women bitches. Well, sorry, I guess I'm going to alienate them. Um, but I, I, and I guess I don't really care if I alienate them. Uh, but would you agree that uh, it's okay to focus uh, mainly on animal rights, but of course acknowledging that any oppression is, is wrong, but the focus being on animal? Sure, absolutely. I uh, that's what I've done with my life, man. I mean, that's what I've done is, is I focused on animal exploitation, but I'm always clear and careful to say that all of this stuff is related. As a matter of fact, it's one of the, one of the main focuses of, of my work has been, um, you know, to sort of show the relationships, you know? And, and so I, I, you know, and I remember once um, somebody I knew, a very dear friend who was an animal doing animal law and she called me one day and she said, I don't want to do animal law anymore. I'm going to take a job doing, working for children, you know, uh, abused, abused children. And I said, that's wonderful. And she said, well, you don't think it's wrong of me to do I said, no, of course not. I said, I think, look, as long as you're trying to make the world a better place, God bless you. But just make sure that you're vegan while you're doing it. So like, like, you know, do, do human rights work, but you got to eat three times a day. Don't eat animals. Do human rights work, but you got to buy shoes. Don't buy leather. Don't buy wool when you buy, you know, you buy clothes. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, uh, that's fine if you want to spend your time focused on animals because the, all, because the argument that you shouldn't spend your time on animals because humans matter more, that's the same anthropocentric nonsense that's got us in this mess in the first place. So I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of that. That's absolutely fine. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much. Yep. Perfect. I'll move you back to the audience. Bully vegan. Very insightful. Um, okay, next up we have Husky. Um, do you think there are problems with holding cubes of truth? Um, I guess we'll, we'll put it in a two-part question. First, with Anonymous for the Voiceless, and secondly, just the program of holding TV screens showing slaughter. Um, it ain't my scene. I, I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it for a couple of reasons. First of all, mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in... You know, you have cubes of truth. You got people standing there with Guy Fawkes masks on, holding holding laptops that have gory f films. Mm -hmm. um, that really sort of sets yourself apart from everybody else. It's an attempt to set yourself apart from everybody else. I'm not really interested in doing that. I want I I want to I want to I, I want to show that vegans are sort of you know we're not weird people. Um, and and um, uh, you know. I think I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't show gory things. You know, when I, when I teach students, I generally don't show them the gory uh, videos, you know, things like earthlings and stuff. And the reason I don't do that is because my experience over the years has been when people see that stuff, they, they react strongly to it. And some of them even will, will go vegan, but they don't stay vegan. And, and the problem is the gory stuff focuses people on the way something is done and all, and in many cases, I can't say always because I don't, I don't know. But in many cases, in my experience, people see this stuff and then they say, "Well, I've got to work to make this better." That's not what I want to get them to do. Is I want to get them to say, "I got to work to stop this altogether," and I'm going to start with myself stopping it altogether, and I'm going to try to talk to other people about about stopping it altogether. Because you know, the reality is, slaughterhouses are are horrible, but you know, they tend to show these. 
you know, when when they when they show the slaughterhouses, they're tending to show um, the stuff that may be illegal, um, stuff that's certainly not the norm in the slaughterhouse. If you show the stuff that's like completely, if you show the best slaughterhouse in the world, the best, the very best one, it's still horrible. And and so I I I I'm just not I'm not a, I'm not an, a fan of showing gory stuff. I also think it's a bad idea because people won't bring their kids. You know, I love to talk to kids. So I love when parents bring their kids. You know, like if I'm, you know, I don't do much tabling anymore. But sometimes when I'm in a in a a, a different city, I'll join some abolitionists. And I'll join their tables because they'll do tables on the weekends and I'll go to the tables. I love talking to people who bring their kids over and you can't, you know, you can't really, you know, kids are really important. we got to change the world. We have to sort of get, you know, kids are, kids are open They're You know, you can educate them it's much better than you can adults. And, and, um, and I like to talk to kids and you can't do that when you're showing these gory things and it tends to put people off. Also, there's another thing I, I always find curious about, you know, uh, and a lot of these these cubes, these these um, these anonymous, they're handing out literature from Mercy for Animals, and I mean these. This shows the level of confusion. I mean, Mercy for Animals is not an abolitionist organization. You know, it's a it's an or Mercy for Animals has been a particularly pro- well, not particularly. They're all problematic, but Mercy for Animals is one of a number of problematic organizations that promotes happy exploitation. I don't. I would do. I would never distribute anything that had a Mercy for Mercy for Animals logo on it because people can, you know, pe- people can will go to the Mercy for Animals site and they'll they'll see that they're promoting all of this, you know, happy exploitation nonsense. Enough. I mean, you know, we ought to get away from that. Uh, uh, one one other point. I don't understand what, where where everybody got this idea that Guy Fox, you know, the 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 masks that everybody wears, these Guy Fox masks. Guy Fawkes was not an anarchist, people. Guy Fawkes was a Catholic. <laughs> Guy Fawkes was a Catholic who was trying to get a Catholic stuck on the throne of England and get rid of the Protestant guy who was there. Guy Fawkes was not an anarchist. He was a Catholic. Um, and so he was a conservative Catholic. So so I think, um, you know, I think we, we need to, you know, I mean, I, but again, you know, it's like, it's like um, I, I watch and I, I love it when I see it, you know, when I go to, you know, when I go to various places and I see these people doing abolitionist uh, 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 education and they don't have gory stuff and they're just like, you know, they're dressed like normal people and they talk to people and they engage people. And it's just wonderful to see them because they really do get people thinking. And that's what you got to do. Freaking people out with gory, gory stuff. Um, in my experience, look, maybe your experience is different, in which case do what, you, do what you want. But my experience has been um, gory stuff tends to have a very limited effect. Um, it's it's limited in what it will do. All right. Awesome. awesome. Perfect. Cool. And, uh, okay, so, so there's a question from Wiseya. Four years ago, in a debate with Eric Marcus, you said – you buy organic vegetables. If animals are persons and not property, don't we have an obligation to minimize the amount of money we give to animal agriculture by avoiding organic due to higher manure use? Um, what about the increase? That, that, that was not four years ago. That debate with Eric, I, I haven't, I, I haven't thought about Eric Mort Marcus in ten years at least. So okay. <laughs> this was the first time in at least a decade I've even thought about Eric Marcus. Um, but that debate had to be fifteen gotcha. years. Ago. Okay, yeah. I think why well, I probably saw it. It was like a YouTube upload, and it's like it was uploaded. Yeah, yeah, you know, that was a long time ago. Um, okay. Gotcha. I actually, I actually, uh, I try to buy uh, veganic now, um, which basically is. Um, uh, but you know it's expensive. But you know I, 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 because I wisely decided not to have children and have more disposable income because I decided not to procreate. Um, I, I will spend my money on veganic agriculture. But no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, the problem is, is that um, all, all agriculture. I mean, because, because we don't care about this issue, you got people who are doing organic stuff. Who are using animal products in the in the growth of the product, you know? And then if you don't if you don't get organic, you got people who are using pesticides that are killing, you know, un, unintentionally and 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 incidentally killing more animals because of poisons and stuff. It's it's not perfect. I mean, the reality is, is if we were all vegans, we'd be able to figure this stuff out a whole lot better. So it's the problem. The problem is you're trying to make a moral decision. In a situation where that moral decision can't happen in anything but 
you know, the context in which it can happen. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, but, you know, all you can do is the best you can do. And, and, but the best you can do always, 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 always means you don't eat them. You don't, you know, you don't eat happy versions of exploited animals. You don't eat animals. Um, and, and, um, you know, are we still going to be responsible for animal deaths? And the answer is, yeah. I mean, look, when animal, when crops are planted and they're harvested, animals are killed. Um, but you know what, when roads are built, humans are killed, you know, I mean, human activity results in humans dying, but we still don't have a problem distinguishing between, um, unintentionally killing people and accidental human deaths and murder. We don't have a problem distinguishing those things. So we need to apply that thinking where animals are concerned. Yeah, we ought to, we ought to cut down to the extent possible all incidental and unintended animal deaths. But there are always going to be some because animal, because human activity results in, you know, all activity results in some harm to somebody, humans and non-humans. Um, but again, just as we um, can't, you know, we, we still retain the ability to distinguish between unintentional killing and murder. We have to be able to distinguish between unintentional animal deaths and and animal exploit, institutionalized animal exploitation. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that gets. Um I think the second part of the question, um, yeah, and what about um, what about um, crop deaths in general? Do you think that we have some sort of obligation to limit our consumption of plants or something, or specifically consume products that have less crop deaths? Or, or uh, what? What is your general take there? Do you well, I mean, we all, we all ought to we all ought to be consuming a lot less. Period. I mean, you know, consumption is a bad thing. I mean, this is, a, this is, you know, we all ought to be eating less. I mean, how much of the American population is like obese, which is like not, you know, and that's not being a sizist. That's just saying there is a, there is a reality that the, the you know, the more excess weight you're carrying, the more health hazards you have. Um, and, and so, um, but, you know, we need to, we all need, you know, um, I mean, this is something I've been thinking about recently. I'm sort of like going down to two meals a day because I think, do I really need to eat three times a day? Do I really need to do that? Um, and and um, so I've been I've been you know experimenting um, you know, for the past I don't know two weeks about with eating two meals, and then sometimes I fast. And so like I think it's a good. And also let me tell you, I, I'm also very careful about buying stuff because buying stuff, you know, you're buying. You know, we all buy too much crap, and that results in a lot of harm to the environment, um, to animals, and to other humans. And so, you know, I always think, do I really want to buy this? Do I really need this? You know, and, and um, you know, do I really need to buy a, a new phone? Do I really need to buy a new computer? Do I really need to buy this piece of junk or that piece of junk? And the answer is, I, I, I really think we could probably all live with, like, less stuff than we buy. Um, and, you know, I mean, I have a car that's... 17 years old um you know now it's bad because it it uses gasoline you know and, and i will buy that when i replace it i will buy an electric car but the car is 17 years old you know and and um uh, it's not that i can't afford to buy a new car i could but it's like why should i this runs <laughs> it runs and it runs pretty efficiently as far as a gas a gasoline burning vehicle is concerned and um and so like um you know, but, but but sure, we ought to do what we can to minimize harm. But that's 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 we ought to go beyond being vegans. I mean, I always say to people, you can you know, being nonviolent requires that you be vegan, but that's not all it requires. <laughs> you know, it requires more. Um, you know, if you're going to lead a, 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 a thoughtful, nonviolent life, I'm a big believer in nonviolence. I have to tell you, I'm a big, 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 big believer in nonviolence. Got well. That translates into another question by Isaiah, actually, um, about the nonviolence. Um, so, regarding um, Jainism, uh, you've done talks yeah. at Jain meetups. Is yeah, this something that you'd, would you, uh, well, first of all, explain Jainism <laughs> to the crowd? And then, do you think veganism should do that? What is the main motivation for this Jainism as compared to a standard veganism? Oh, it's not, it's, it's, well, Jainism. Jainism is one of the um, indigenous re religion, religious traditions in South Asia, uh, along with Hinduism and Islam and, uh, and Buddhism. Um, but Jainism is a, a dharma that is focused 
primarily on ahimsa, nonviolence, where, you know, ahimsa shows up in these other traditions, but it, it, with Jainism, it is the fundamental tradition. It is the, it is the focus of the tradition. And, um, and yeah, I, I mean, the problem is, is Jains are vegetarian. I've never met a Jain, never, never, not once, that wasn't a vegetarian. And I've met zillions of them. Um, but they're also not as many, you know, there are very few vegans, more now, but they're, you know, when I first started doing this stuff and working with the Jain community, nobody was a vegan. And, um, you know, and that part of that is, you know, it's a tradition that grew up in India where it was, it was sort of overwhelmed by Hinduism and Hindus are big believers in consuming dairy products on spiritual base, on, on spiritual grounds. And so, you know, there, and so, yeah, I, I give a lot of talks in Jain places um, uh, and I talk about, I talk about, um, uh, 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 veganism and the importance of veganism and nonviolence. Yes, I do. I do talk about that, but that's, but that's, you know, it's not, it's not a theistic religion. Just so you understand something. Jainism, mm -hmm. is not, there is no God in Jainism. I mean, not, not, there is no creator God. So it's like not a, it's not a, a theism, which is even sort of remotely similar to to the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, or even to Hinduism in certain ways, um, but there's it's it's basically it, it, it's 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 a um, it's a it's a tradition which um, doesn't have a creator God, and it just focuses on the importance of nonviolence um, as the fundamental principle, and that I find that very appealing. I like that idea, and I've known I've have I have a lot of friends who are Jains and. Um, I've, I've been influenced by some Jane spiritual teachers, you know, in terms of, of, uh, who were vegans, by the way. But, um, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you know, my work is all independent of that. I mean, that's a personal thing with me. I'm a big, big believer in nonviolence, but, um, but I think there are rational reasons to be, um, in favor of nonviolence, but I also spiritually believe in nonviolence. Fantastic. So... What do you think about um, eating certain plants? Uh, for specific, I think it's um, the root plants, if I'm not mistaken, the root vegetables, which cause the plants to die. And uh, Jane's avoid those, if I'm not mistaken. I was wondering what your take is on the ethics of doing that. That's true. Um, it does. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm um, well, it's complicated. Many Janes believe that. Um, Plants, plants are clearly alive, and Jains believe that plants are ensouled. That is, um, uh, they they believe that 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 plants have souls, Jeeves. Um, I don't know that I believe that. I certainly um, have 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 not accepted that, and I do eat root vegetables, um, and I don't. It, it I it doesn't just because I go to Jain temples and I. Um, practice Jain meditation and I do Jain sorts of things doesn't mean I believe everything in Jainism. Um, and, um, and I don't, you know, I don't, uh, n not eat potatoes or onions or garlic or things like that. Um, because, uh, you know, they have various views about the spiritual, the spiritual status of potatoes or something. Um, I, I uh, my view is, is that they're alive we ought to eat as few of them as possible because not because they are in sold, but because the more we eat, if we eat unnecessarily, we deprive other people who need the food of the food. Um, but, um, but I, I don't, I don't, um, uh, uh, believe that, um, uh, plant, I, I don't believe that, um, uh, people get recycled into plants or, you know, the humans, I, I, I mean, I don't even know what I think about reincarnation as a German. I understand that's a fundamental thing about Jainism. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that because Jains believe, well, Jains believe that if we do not liberate ourselves from this sphere, then we were, then our karma will bring us back as other beings. Um, you know, what do I think about that? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, the nice thing about Jainism is there is no Pope. <laughs> there is no Pope in Jainism that tells you what the rules are that you have to, you know, there, there is no central authority. Um, it's, um, my main interest in it is in the whole principle of nonviolence and what that means. And, um, whether or not I am reincarnated, I have no idea whether it will be. Um, and, and, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not all that 
concerned about those sorts of issues. All right. Perfect. And um, can one be a vegan animal welfareist? Do you consider? Sure. Okay. And sure. so, yeah, how do you, um, what definition of veganism do you usually operate under? Veganism, a vegan is somebody who doesn't eat, wear, or you know, use animal products, basically. Um, that's what a vegan is. So yeah, you can be a vegan, you know, you can be an animal welfare. You can be a person who promotes animal welfare stuff. Who's a vegan. I mean, the problem is, is I think, I think there's a tendency to, to, to um, uh, try to lump everything that you think is morally good in veganism. So, you know, you see these people say things like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of something I saw the other day that sort of raised this issue and they said, "Oh, oh, it was about palm oil." Somebody said, "You can't be a, you can't be a vegan and eat palm oil." And I said, "Well, there might be there might be good reasons to not eat palm oil, but it, it it it's vegan in the sense that if you eat other oils, those other oils result in the killing of other animals." Um Except, you know, the, they're not orangutans and bonobos. So, like, are you saying that the orangutans and bonobos matter more? That oil oil that results in killing um, orangutans and bonobos is worse than oil that results in killing animals that aren't, that aren't non-human great apes. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, again, this goes to the whole idea that everything we do has harm, which is one of the things I like about Jainism, by the way. Jainism teaches that all of our actions – have rep have negative repercussions, which is why um, we ought to observe certain sorts of, of practices. For example, Jains don't travel, and I, I since I started getting into Jainism, I don't I don't uh, Jain Jain people Jain monks and nuns don't travel. They don't believe in traveling. They don't believe in using cars and things because you know you you, you know traveling results in killing other beings and so you know one of the things i've been doing over the past few years and this was this has really been helped helped by covid you see every cloud has a silver lining um i um when i get invited to speak to play, places and we say well you know we would like you to come we'd like to fly you um to this country or that country and there was there was a time in my life I would have said, yeah, that's really great. They're going to pay for me to go to X, Y, or Z. And now I I say, well, you know, look, you don't have to pay me to do any. First of all, I don't take money to do this work anyway. But you you don't have to pay for my trip to come to X place or Y place. I'll be happy to do it for you over the internet for free. And I'm really good at. I mean, I do these things. You know, I mean, this one is not a visual thing, but I do these things where like I interact with people for hours and stuff. I teach classes. Um, on, 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 on Zoom. Um, and, and, um, and so, you know, I, I think it's important to, um, you know, keep that in mind. The idea that we travel as much as we do is insane. I mean, environmentally, I mean, tra air travel is a disaster for the environment. Um, and, and, and for, for, for non-human animals, you know, we, you know, a lot of animals get sucked into airplane engines and stuff like that. So, um, so I, I, um, I'm a, a a big believer in um, you know we ought to we ought to minimize you know the harm that we you know but but also I think that you know if if I were if I were to accept an invitation um, and say okay fine I'm going to go to country X and give a talk on animal rights if somebody said well you're not a vegan because I would I would find that odd you you might want to say you ought not to do that that that's not morally a right a good thing for you to do but it doesn't mean I'm not a vegan you know I mean I got into some trouble a few years ago I get in trouble with animal people all the time but yeah. but, but and that's okay um when I say diet they had cheese or diet cheese or I don't eat that stuff cuz it's like so unhealthy I don't particularly like it either anyway but um at some point diet cheese got bought by a company that did animal testing Mm. And so people started saying, well, diet cheese was no longer vegan because it had the same ingredients, didn't have any animal products, but it was no longer vegan because the company that owned diet cheese was doing animal testing. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. Of course, it's still vegan. You might not want to eat it, but I mean, what's the difference between a company that does animal testing and a company that doesn't do animal testing but serves animal products in its cafeteria. So let's assume you've got a company that's producing diet cheese and or, or producing some some non non dairy cheese, and um, and it 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 had it's got a company cafeteria where they're serving animal products. 
What's the difference between that and the company that's doing animal testing? I mean, I, I think it's arbitrary. So, I mean, the problem is, is all money is dirty. And once you start getting away from what's in the product, um, you, you, you can't really, you know, like, like I can go to a, I can go to a, a vegan restaurant. Um, and, but, but the, but not everybody who works in the vegan restaurant is necessarily a vegan. As a matter of fact, I, you know, the place I go to that's near my house, they're all vegans. But, um, but they're, you know, but but a lot of vegan restaurants, you know, are employing people who aren't vegan. So you're putting money in the pocket of non-vegans, and they're going out and they're they're buying animal products. So does that mean I'm no longer a vegan because I'm eating in a restaurant in which, you know, I'm I'm putting money in the pockets of people who aren't vegans, or even in the place that I go to that's near my house, the Greyhound Cafe, which is one of the best vegan restaurants in the universe. Um, Greyhound and, Cafe. I'm sorry. I said I'll keep I'll keep a note of that. <laughs> oh yeah, it's great. It's a terrific place, and um, and you know they're all vegans, but I suspect they have suppliers who aren't vegans, and they have you know they have people who are delivering stuff that aren't vegans, and so you know I'm I'm supporting those people. So does that mean I'm no longer a vegan because I'm supporting people who aren't vegan? And so I think you know once you you know this idea that like like. You can only be a vegan if you're sort of not doing any harm to animals. The answer is, well, you might as well just shoot yourself now because there's really no way you can avoid that. You know, I mean, all money is dirty. There's you, there's no way you can draw lines that way. And so, you know, I mean, you might want to say that there's, I mean, I don't eat, like, I don't eat, um, there may be other reasons. Like, I don't eat, like, chocolate that isn't fair traded chocolate uh, because of the human rights issues. Or or cashews, cashews, uh, you know, involve a yeah. Those are a big one. You know, I mean, but that's not. I, I mean, but those are other reasons I have to not eat those products. It's not that they're not vegan. I mean, if I ate the cashews, I would still be a vegan. If I ate the chocolate, as long as it didn't have milk in it, I would still be a vegan. But I don't eat those things because of other human rights issues that you know that I'm concerned about. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, and briefly, so. How do you feel about um, freeganism, uh, such as the practice, uh, you know, of like dumpster diving for food, or say I order some something from a restaurant and it comes out with cheese on it, and you know they're just gonna throw it away if I don't eat it or whatever. Have I done something? Do I do something wrong if I eat the cheese? Should I not eat it? Should I donate it? What do you think your stance is there? Um, what should vegans well, do? And what's I the right would, thing? I would need it. I don't. I mean, I would. I mean, look. If I was going through a dumpster and I found a freshly severed human arm, um, I wouldn't say, "Well, you know, this arm is like nice and warm. You know, it's just been cut off. You know, I think I'll eat it." Because humans, humans aren't things to eat. I really want to encourage the idea that animals are not. Things to eat, and so you know the the idea that that the fact that you're going through the the dumpster and you find the animal product, you're not you're not actively creating demand because you're you're eating something which has been thrown away. You are still creating demand in the sense that you're participating in the eating of animals, which is something that I think we need to get away from. So no, I wouldn't eat the the hamburg. And if something when when I'm in a restaurant. <coughs> I don't I don't eat cooked food in restaurants that aren't vegan, but um, no, not anymore. But um, um, because I because I just don't trust them. But um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if I were in a restaurant and I ordered a vegan you know meal and it came with you know real cheese on it, I would I would need it because animal products are not things to eat. That's that's I mean, I really want to get that's you know, I, I want to get away from this idea that animals are things to eat or that they produce things to eat. And the only way you do that is by not, you know, by not participating in that. So, you know, um just as I wouldn't, you know, if if um if if you know, somebody if 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 they brought my, you know, rice pee off to the table and it had like pieces of human fingers in it, I wouldn't eat it because human human beings are not things to eat. Um, I, I wouldn't eat eat it if there were animal products either. Uh, you can say, well, you know, you're wasting the human product. Well, that's fine. I'm wasting it. But I just, animals are not things to eat and I'm not going to, I'm just not going to consume them. All right. Awesome. Um, so have you heard of the, um, oh no, I'm completely blanking. The um bad news for you. That just gets worse as you get older. Oh, no. <laughs> it's the bad news for today. 
Oh, all right. It's the I think it's the abolitionist pledge. People will put like forks around their uh, wrists, and they like refuse to eat at a table where there is animal products or is like someone else. Is this a direct action for animals thing? Is that is that is that? Uh, I'm not positive where it was started. The first, I know okay. it's okay. some sort of pledge, and the liberation pledge. That's what it's called. It's called the liberation, liberation pledge. Yeah, nonsense, um, nonsense. No, I don't. I don't subscribe to that. My view is I'll. All sit, right. I'll, I'll, I'll look. I want to educate people, and and the idea that you know what the hell is the difference between sitting at a table with somebody who's like going to eat animal products in two hours, and I mean, if the idea is you don't want to, you know, you want to make sure that you register your objection, well, then register your objection. While in, I mean, you can, re- you know, my view is is that I want to talk to everybody who will sit still long enough to listen, mm-hmm. and so I will. I will eat with people who are eating animal products because it always, it's always like, I mean, the main, the main situation is where I get into this sort of thing. Cause I generally don't, so I don't socialize with non-vegans, but the, you know, like for example, if I, if I, well, I don't, I mean, as a practical matter, I just don't. I mean, the people I, people I hang out with are vegans. Um, but, um, uh, but you know, if I'm at a university function, you know, like I have to go to some dinner at the university and, you know, I'm sitting there and I have my vegan, my vegan plate and everyone else is sitting, eating whatever rotting corpses they're eating. And the thing is, is that I always, in those situations, I always get to talk to people because somebody at that table, I don't even have to do it. That's the beautiful thing about it. Somebody at the table will say, Gary, why aren't you? Why aren't yeah. you having a wonderful, st- you know, and, and, um, and then I get into a discussion about veganism and I do this all the time. I mean, I, I wouldn't pass up that opportunity for all the, you know, I, I just, I wouldn't pass that opportunity up. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, liberation pledge, you know, I mean, it's like, these are gimmicks as far as I'm concerned, these are gimmicks. And, and, um, uh, I don't think that they're, you know, their, their efforts to, I, I mean, uh, I don't know who, I can tell you that this the liberation pledge was brought to me by somebody who was saying that it was it was uh, branded to a particular organization. I don't know whether that's true or not, but um, but I mean, I think these are these are these are things which are used to promote organizations. I don't think they have any meaning. As a matter of fact, I think that one is particularly silly. I mean, it's like why the hell wouldn't I? I mean, what's the difference between sitting and eating with somebody who's eating animal products? And sitting with somebody who's not eating animal products but is wearing leather shoes, or is or is wearing yeah. a wool, or wearing a wool sweater. I mean, does it mean? I mean, is it only with respect to eating animals? I mean, it's okay if the person is sitting there wearing leather and wool and fur and all together at once. Um, you know, that's okay. Or or this is somebody who's going to be eating animal products in ten minutes after I leave. I mean, but it's okay for me to be there for the ten minutes when they're not eating. I mean, it's just sort of really arbitrary and silly. I mean, my view is is I talk to anybody who will. <laughs> Sit still or stand still long enough for you to talk to. That's my view. That's my my governing principle. Never let a day go by without talking to some. I mean, I if you knew the number of weird. I mean, I can be sitting in a vet office and you know I can get into a discussion because you know you're sitting there with another person. And as a matter of fact, recently I was in a vet office and and I was having a conversation with somebody and you know she was telling me about how much she loves her cat and I said you know I said isn't it funny how we love these animals, but like, you know, yet we, we, you know, we eat animal. I mean, I can get into a discussion with anybody on this, you know, it's just like, there's always a, an opening. And my view is you take every opening and, and, um, uh, and interestingly, I, that person, we started talking and then she said, what, what would I do with my cat? And I said, well, you know, I said, look, I said, you know, um, it, it's a problem. Cats are carnivores. I said, you know, I said uh, some cats will develop crystals if they don't have animal products, but some cat, cats will just, you know, develop crystals even if they do have the, those products. Um, and, um, you know, but even if you can't, you know, if you can't feed your cat vegan, um, I, I doubt whether, you know, well, obviously it's not justifiable to feed the cat meat, but what, what are you going to do? Kill the cat? But the important thing is, are you a vegan? You have a choice. The cat may not have a choice. We ought to stop bringing cats into existence. We ought to stop having domesticated animals. But the problem is, is that, you know, you're not a vegan and you can make a choice. And so, um, and so, you know, I, I talked to, I mean, and, and by the way, in case anybody was, was wondering, our dogs, and I think we're at number 26 now. We've had, I think, I think we've had 26 dogs since we've been together. 
Um, and um, the ones in the beginning, I think in the very beginning, were not vegans. I'm not sure. But our dogs have been vegans for decades now. And they're very, you know, it's very. Really? It's very, oh, yeah, there's great. Uh, there's There are no animal products in this house, bro. None. <laughs> not a, nothing. 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 That's what I like to hear. Oh, my okay. girlfriend and I are getting a cat soon, uh, so we're gonna have to be doing a whole bunch of research. Yeah, well, there. you know, I mean, yeah, you, you know, th there are I, again. I'm not a cat person because I don't live with. You know, when you have the number of dogs I have, you don't have cats because it, it's it's kind of, that constitutes that constitutes right. animal, animal abuse per se. But um, uh, but I got plenty of friends, including vets, who have vegan cats. You know, and and um, uh, I mean, I think you have to with males. I think you have to be careful. You know, you have to have their pH tested now and then to make sure that they're that they're not, you know, at risk of developing crystals, but there are some really good vegan foods. I, be, I believe the food that I use for the dogs, a lot of people use, I use evolution. And I think a lot of people use that for cats as well. Um, but, you know, but I mean, look, the thing, the thing is, I mean, I, you know, I remember, you know, years ago having animal people say that, well, we should kill all cats because, and I thought, well, are you people crazy? Um, you know, I mean, that that's wrong. You know, they're in existence because of us. And we ought not to be producing more of them with this idea that we, you know, animal people running around saying we've got to be killing all the cats struck me as being um, uh, um, uh, a very peculiar thing to say. Although, you know, I have to say that was uh, I remember the person who used to say that. And that was um, back in the days when I was living in Greenwich Village in New York. And New York was such a strange place. And it's still a strange place. But um, uh, and so I'm not, I don't know whether that whether that view got outside of New York City about what we should kill all the cats, but it certainly was a position that was articulated. All right, perfect. Um, so I have a question. So would you be pro removing currently existing um, animal rights or animal welfare laws? Well, I don't think it'd make a hell of a lot of difference because the bottom line is, is that most animal welfare laws don't require anything more than that animal owners act as rational property owners. I mean, you know, which I believe they they probably I, I don't think it would make a hell of a lot of difference one way or another. I mean, I really don't. I don't think it would make a lot of difference. I mean, if you got rid of the Federal Animal Welfare Act, do I, I mean, look, that's a perfect example. The Federal Animal Welfare Act requires that animals be stunned before they're shackled, hoisted, and cut. Now, the reality is a lot of animals are not made to be unconscious through through um, uh, uh, stunning. They're made to be immobile. So I've been in slaughterhouses before where I've seen animals, you know, plenty of animals, semi-conscious while they're hanging there. They just can't move because they're stunned. It's like tasering them. You know, they can't move. Oh. They're so and 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 there was actually there was actually um, a, uh, an article some years ago in the Washington Post. Um, I forget the reporter Toby somebody I forgot what his last name was, but um, he did a he did a, a story about going around slaughterhouses and the number of animals who were conscious um, when they were being butchered, and it's fairly high. And um, so the the rule is enforced only to the extent that it's economically efficient. That is, it's economically efficient to process more animals, um, and so so you you don't stun them for the period of time that you need to stun them or stun them in a way that keeps them completely unconscious. You just stun them in a way which keeps them immobile so that they're not moving around and causing carcass damage or worker injuries. So so. The, you know, the rules, the, the the welfare rules get and laws get interpreted so as to maximize utility and the economic value of animals anyway. So it's not clear to me that it would make a hell of a lot of difference, um, uh, you know, but that's not going to happen. I mean, you know, that's not going to obviously, you, you, mm -hmm. you know, that's not going to happen anyway. But if it did. Wouldn't it wouldn't be the biggest the would wouldn't be the biggest disaster for animals you know I mean it really wouldn't what what what's the big what a big disaster is for animals is ironically all of these animal welfare groups that are promoting happy exploitation that's a disaster <laughs> that's a real disaster because it's encouraging people to believe there's a right way to do the wrong thing. All right, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to read off 
one last question. Then unfortunately, I have to go to work. But my lovely uh, fellow vegan, Jake, will be taking over my position. Okay. But I've got one more question. Just bringing off that. All right. So how do you think about voting on specific animal welfare legislation. Example, California's proposition about animal welfare, like the recent Prop 12. For example, if someone votes against more space plus better conditions for the animals, are they not condemning the animals to worse conditions? From the animal's perspective, would they not prefer those better conditions, even if the human motivations are tarnished by economic reasons, etc.? Does voting against animal welfare make it more likely that people will stop viewing animals as property, or does it make it less likely? No, it makes it. I mean, animal welfare makes it more likely that people are going to start. Are, are people that makes it well, well it depends how you interpret it. It's going to make it less likely for people to reject animals as property because they're going to believe that there's a right way and an acceptable way to use animal property. So I think that's that's a huge problem. Number one, number two. Look at Proposition Two, for example. Okay, because you know I I basically said you know um, uh, that I I wouldn't vote for Prop Two. I just wouldn't vote on that because I thought it was a disaster. And it was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm sure I don't have to tell you the history of Proposition 2. Um, you know, and, and, and that, that, you know, it, what it did was it gave a lot of hype to California's animal agriculture industry and got people to think that animal agriculture was like really much better in California and that people ought to consume, Cal, you know, California animals. It didn't even come into 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 effect for years um and then ultimately um you know there was a huge fight between hsus and everybody else because hsus said well it required that animals have certain you know have have certain space standards and but those standards were not spelled out <coughs> in the proposition and so um you know it really it really what it did was it was a, it was it was a net loss for animals um because what it did was it it gave animals virtually nothing, and it gave California agriculture a huge hype in terms of of how 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 great um, California animal agriculture was. So you know, I, I I I'm just not a. I mean, if you look at these standards, these standards like they're vague. They take years and years to you know come into effect. And then ultimately, they don't, you know, I mean, they, they don't really have a, 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 a great effect anyway. I mean, in a lot of cases, what you do is you just, you know, the, 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 the um, I mean, right now they're having a discussion in California because California has, has a rule that says that if you don't um, comply with the California law, you can't ship food in to California. Well, that's going to have an effect on California agriculture, which will basically, you know, I mean, how much of an effect will it have? I don't know. Um, nobody knows. But um, that that sort of thing can can adversely affect California legisl uh, California agriculture relative to agriculture in other parts of the country. But all that's going to do is just result in, in, as I believe there are efforts now, to stop the proposition, these propositions from being put on ballots in the first place which I think is happening in a lot of places. So I just, I don't, I don't think it's a pro I don't, I don't think it's, it's like this great benefit for animals that, that we're going to, we're going to lose. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to continue with Jake for as long as feel free to just let us know if you, uh, if you're burnt out or want to stop yeah, or anything. I, I, I'm, I'm a vegan for 40 years, man. I don't get burnt out. Um, uh, and, yeah, we, we know, knew <laughs> someone just, called you're going to say that in chat. I just, I just have I just have endless energy, um, but but I do have to go in a little while because I got like a bunch of other things I got to do. Um, but you're going to work now. What do you do? Like, what do you you don't like um, work at the University of Vermont vivisection lab? Do you? Or I don't. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm a server. It's just that I need to pay rent. Unfortunately, it's not an entirely vegan restaurant, but uh, there is vegan options. Oh, so, okay. um, but yeah, thank you so much. Really, really great having you. I hope to keep in contact in the future, and hopefully you can come back and maybe do another event or whatever. But yeah, it was sure. amazing yeah. meeting you. Um, and I will let Jake take it away. Okay. Right. See you all. Take care. Bye. Take care. Ari, I guess I'll just dive right in. Um, yeah, I, I'll reiterate uh, Parquet's uh, sentiments at the end there. If, if at any point you, you're, you're uh, ready to sort of close out, then uh, feel free to say... But I think with the number of listeners we have, and I think uh, what everyone would agree is uh, currently a, a very engaging stage, I think everyone wants to continue. So, um, Okay, fine.
Go ahead. If you're not, if you're not opposed to that, then uh, <laughs> I'm, not I'm not opposed to anything. Well, I'm opposed to animal exploitation. But... <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, I guess I'll just pick up where Parquet left off. Um, the last question Parquet asked you had a uh, a sort of suffix to it. I think I could probably read that out and you can elaborate and then we can move on to the next question. Um, so the suffix to that question was, um, in particular, you mentioned something about how the call of the cows uh, who wouldn't care about Meet This Monday's campaigns, uh, by the same token, wouldn't the uh, cows or calves not care about uh, stances against welfareism uh, for the principle of abolition, if it means those stances would keep the same terrible conditions instead of slightly better conditions? It's a zero-sum game. I mean, you, you know, you, if you pursue welfare reform, you're not pursuing veganism. Mm -hmm. So, like, well, you know, should we be promoting welfareism because the animals would prefer welfareism? I mean, what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. The animals would prefer welfare. The animals don't. <laughs> the animals aren't going to prefer welfareism. Um, it's a zero-sum. It's a zero-sum game. If this is my last day on Earth, I can spend this time working for animal welfare reform, or I can spend this time talking to people about veganism. It's a zero-sum game. If I do one, I can't do the other. So the question becomes, what do we? what is the best way to effect um, uh, uh, the abolition of animal exploitation? You ain't never going to get there by promoting supposedly more humane exploitation because all that's going to do is make people feel more comfortable about continuing to exploit animals. That is clear. I mean, look at history at the fact that when in Britain in the 19th century, when they started regulating vivisection, the number of animals used in vivisection went through the roof. Why? Because people believed it was regulated and that made people feel better about it. And that's the whole thing what we do with animal welfare as a general matter. I mean, look, you know, I was a meat eater and a dairy eater and an egg eater until I was in my 20s. And and I basically, you know, took the position. I, I, I always thought, well, animals are being treated. You know, there are there are laws that require that they be treated humanely. And and you know, this is the this is the 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 myth. You know, uh, what's her name? Uh, Melanie Joy talks about you know. Uh, um, uh, uh, carnism and about the invisible, you know, that this, this is an invisible, um, uh, uh, system of, you know, it, it's, it keeps it from us. It's not invisible at all. Animal welfare is right out there and it's right in our faces. And it basically says, it's all right for us to use and kill them because they don't have an interest in continuing to live. They only have an interest in, in not suffering. And it's all right for us to continue to use them. That ain't hidden anywhere. That's quite out in the open. I mean, I think I, I find this whole thing about carnism being an invisible ideology absurd. I mean, what that what that does is it tries to excuse people because, well, you didn't really, you know, you were you were a victim of carnism. We're not victims of carnism. We're not victims of it. We're the victims are the animals. We aren't the victims in that respect. Um, and the victims are the animals. So, so I think it's a zero sum game. You say, well, you know, wouldn't the animals like, you know, wouldn't the animals like, you know, uh, uh, this or that? That's not the point. The point is, what is, what are our choices now? What can we do now to make a difference? And the answer is, it's never going to be. If we, if we focus on animal welfare, all it's going to do is what it's been doing for the past 200 and some odd years, which is actually making people feel better about continuing to use animals. Mm -hmm. I think some, yeah, some very good uh, points raised there that I think often people don't think about. Um, it, it may be preferable for the animals to uh, not be tortured as much, but um, in doing so, if it makes people more comfortable to purchase those animals in the first place, it's probably counterintuitive. Yeah, but but you know, you will say torture them that much. I mean, <laughs> uh, look at the difference between you know between a conventional battery cage and an enriched cage i mean it ain't that great you know i mean i mean you know the thing is the thing is is that not even these conservative animal welfare organizations think that enriched cages are great or that they that they provide significant welfare benefits i mean i was in you you sound from your accent like you're english are you english i am yes. <laughs> i i you know i remember a couple of years ago um, when that, well, I guess it was more than a couple of years ago because the 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 european community ban on conventional um uh, eggs, I think was 2012. I don't remember. I don't remember when it was. I, I think it was 2012. I don't remember. Um, but it was, it went on for, it went on for like 12 years. It was a campaign that went on for 12 years. And then finally they got this, you know, it came into effect. 
that people were not supposed to have conventional battery cages. Now, of course, you know, there are still battery, conventional battery cages all over the place, but they're not supposed to exist anymore. And I remember, I remember being in, in a, in a, another professor's back garden in Lincolnshire. And, um, we were over there visiting and we were having, um, you know, uh, drinks or coffee or whatever with some, some people who were, um, professors and they had a they had a um uh uh backyard area where they had you know they had hen boxes you know they had they had areas for hens and i said do you have hens and the woman said um no we used to take hens from batteries we used to rescue animals from batteries but now that those are no longer you know now that we have eggs you know, produce humanely. We don't, you know, we don't, um, you know, rescue chickens anymore. And, you know, we're, we're really very happily eating eggs again. These, these people were like real, I mean, it's like, these are people who are university professors. They, you know, and this is the level of thinking, you know, is that, well, you know, it's, you know, they're out of the convention, convention, conventional cages and they're in, they're in enriched cages, which is nonsense. And, and, um, and and uh, uh, you know and and that makes us that makes it all okay and I can eat eggs again. I mean, I don't I don't think that that's you know I don't and so and then then what that does is it basically allows people to feel better about continuing to eat animals. And so you could say, well, you know, well, but that's not really as bad because even though more animals are being tortured, they're being tortured in less extreme ways. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, frankly, if I were a battery hen. Um, I'm not sure I'd notice the difference between a conventional cage and an enriched cage, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I'm not sure I would notice the difference between an enriched cage and a, and a cage-free egg, where instead of being in a small cage, I'm in one huge cage where there's a zillion animals and they're all still walking over me and defecating on me and urinating on me and pecking me, et cetera, et cetera. It's still quite horrible. I mean, cage-free eggs are really horrible. They are produced by torturing animals. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so um, I'll move on to the next question now. It's a, a bit of a change of pace. This one comes from Paige, and it's, uh, what is your favorite vegan meal? Uh, and then she goes on to say, mine is spicy lentil rice. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the things about being a vegan is the, uh, the, op the option, the food options are endless. Mm. And they're all wonderful. I am a big fan of Indian food. Um, and so I eat a huge amount of, of, um, uh, lentil dishes, huge, huge, huge amount of lentil dishes. And, um, uh, you know, and so, I mean, and I like, I actually like to cook. I, I mean, I eat a lot of raw food. I eat a lot of raw, you know, vegetables and fruits and stuff, but, um, I enjoy cooking. Um, and so, um, I like, um, you know, but I enjoy pl playing with spices and, and stuff. So yeah, I mean, I, I, it's amazing. I have a stomach lining left because I eat, <laughs> I eat very, very hot stuff and, um, and I, I, I continue to survive, but, um, but I yeah, no, I, I'm system. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do, <laughs> I, I, I do have to say when people say to me, well, isn't it hard to be a vegan? I don't say, are you nuts? I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it, the the food choices are endless, mm -hmm. um, and they're delicious, and they're easy, and they're cheap. We have a I have a site called HowDoIGoVegan dot com, and like everything else I do with you know I don't have employees, I don't <laughs> I don't <laughs> run a, I don't run a business, um, and and you know I have I have people who volunteer to help, and um, and one of them is this woman who's a professor in Ireland. She's a medievalist. And she's like developed all of these recipes, really delicious vegan recipes, you know, where you can feed a family of, you know, six on, you know, $3 or $4. I mean, very small amounts of money. And it's really easy. It's easy to be a vegan. It's cheap to be a vegan. Um, you know, you don't have to, like, you know, what's expensive are these artificial, like, you know, like the like if you buy these fake meats and these fake cheeses, they can be expensive. I don't eat any of that stuff because first of all, I don't eat. I don't want to be reminded of the fact that I once ate meat. So I don't eat. I don't eat. The, I don't eat the fake meat stuff at all. And um, and and um, uh, but you know that stuff is like high in salt and and doesn't have a whole lot of nutritional value. But um, uh, but but it it it's um, 
you know, but I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, it, it ain't no sacrifice to be a vegan. Um, uh, not at all. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's easy. It's delicious. I mean, um, I'm trying to, the other night we made, we had a curry that was out of this world and, um, and I had some, uh, a batter of fermented, uh, lentils and rice, um, oh, wow. and, and, and made, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these pancakes. They call them utapam, or I guess you can call them. The, well, they're, they're, you can make pancakes out of the fermented lentil rice thing. And so I made these pancakes, and and we had you know the curry, um, you know the 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 mung dal curry on top of it. And it was just like, and I, I it cost I don't know probably cost like four dollars, five dollars, and it was mm-hmm. it was just absolutely fabulous, you know. And and um, so I think it's really easy. I mean, I don't. I don't, you know, I don't consider it a sacrifice to be a vegan at all. I consider it a great joy. It's probably the, one of the best things I ever did in my life. Um, but, um, you know, but I don't, I don't consider it. I mean, you know, when I think about it, I think about, you know, I spent, I spent like 20 some odd years being a non-vegan, never even thinking about the issue, to be honest with you. I never even thought about the issue. Um, and, you know, it was a different time. It was, you know. It was a different time. People, I never even heard the word. I became a vegetarian, I think, in, I don't know, 70, in the 70s. I didn't even know what a vegan was. I'd never even heard the word vegan. I thought you would die if you didn't eat some animal products. I mean, it would, <laughs> no, 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 but seriously, if you go back, I mean, it's, yeah, hard, yeah. it's hard for you all to remember, you know, I mean, it was the day, it was the days before we, we, we had computers. You know, I actually, when I went to college and grad school and law school, I actually used a pad and took notes. Um, and, and didn't have, you know, we didn't have computers when we, when we went to the library, you had to go to the library and go to the card catalog where there were actually like index cards for all of the books. And, um, it was a different time, but I didn't even know what a vegan was. I'd never even heard the word vegan. And, um, I became a vegetarian because I went to a slaughterhouse and I, it upset me a great deal. And I stopped eating meat and, and, and fish. Oh, I actually, I stopped, I stopped eating meat. And 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 birds and you know birds and cows and chickens and, uh, and and yeah and chickens and stuff. And yeah. but I kept on eating fish. And then I read something about fish being sentient, so I stopped eating fish. But I continued <laughs> to I continued to eat dairy and eggs because you know I thought well, you know if you didn't get some animal protein you were going to die. And then I I found out about veganism in '82 and I became a vegan immediately. I mean it was overnight, literally. Um, and I became I became a vegan, but. Um, and people say, well, you know, don't you think it's okay to become a vegetarian? You know, you were a vegetarian first. And I said, yeah, because I was, I was stupid. I didn't understand. <laughs> I, I didn't understand. I didn't even know what a vegan was. I'd never yeah. even heard the word vegan. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, uh, ironically it was the PETA people because I met the PETA people in early, the early 1980s. And, um, and they introduced me to veganism. Um, uh, and, um, as I said, I was I was very um, you know close with them for years, uh, and we had fallings out mostly mostly about well about two two issues. One was um, the fact that they had um, you know that they were killing animals uh, that they were taking in at their shelter, um, and they claimed to be doing it humanely, but I didn't believe that it was okay to kill any animals for any reason um, except for sickness, illness, and also because I had huge problems with PETA over the sexism issue i'd rather go vegan or naked than wear fur and all that crap and i just thought i thought you know this is a for me this is a serious movement and i'm not really you know we're not going to we're not going to get people to go vegan by you know having women sitting naked in cages um and you know i mean that may that may entertain teenagers but i didn't think it was a really serious um you know, and so we had we had issues about that, but but yeah, it was the it was the PETA people who first I first heard about veganism through them, and um, uh, you know, and that was you know when we, when we when I was first working with PETA, there were about twenty of us. I mean, it was a very small organization. Wow. Yeah, it was very it was very small, and and um, uh, and I just happened to meet them coincidentally because I I I was was working uh, I was clerking on the United States Supreme Court, and a dog got hit. Uh, in front of the court, and I called the Washington Humane Society, and they sent over an, uh, a, a person, you know, an agent to to help me with the dog, and it turned out to be Ingrid Newkirk, and she had just she and Alex Pacheco had just started PETA, 
literally the year before. And it was a very small, it was a tiny, tiny, tiny organization. And, um, and, and, uh, we had a long conversation about, uh, well, she she introduced me to veganism. It was the first time I ever even heard the word vegan. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. What's, what's a vegan? And um, and so I became a vegan immediately. Uh, well, the, the, as soon as I found out that I didn't need to eat animal products for you know for health reasons, um, uh, you know, it was uh, it was it was easy. It was just easy. And and I have to tell you, back then, I really wasn't. I wasn't into cook. I love cooking now. I find it very, mm. I love it, but I wasn't, I didn't then. And, um, you know, it was, uh, there wasn't a whole lot out there either. Cause I remember like now that, now oh, they yeah, have, yeah. you know, now they have these, these really like great, you know, like, like things that you can get and stuff, not, not mm. the fake meats, but the, you know, the, the things that mimic ice creams and stuff, you know, the sweet stuff, you know, they yeah. didn't have, they didn't have any of that stuff back then. You know, I mean, I remember the first time I had soy ice cream it was called ice bean. I almost vomited. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was horrible. It was unbelievably horrible. Wow. But anyway, anything That's else? Just, eating yeah. out might've been, might've been difficult as well. Oh, um, it was horrible. It was hard. You couldn't eat. There wasn't, there was, you couldn't eat in vegan a restaurants. Salad, maybe, right? That would have been your option. What? I, I said a salad might have been your only oh, option. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. There were, you could, you could eat in restaurants, but there weren't, there weren't vegan restaurants. There were, ve there were some vegetarian restaurants, but you know, they're vegetarian. And, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, if they're vegetarian, they're, you know, that's really no different. So they got dairy, they got dairy and eggs. They don't have meat. So what? Um, and, and so you had, you know, you had a, I mean, the number of times I didn't eat meals because it came with, you know, supposedly vegetarian or vegan, but then it would come with cheese on it or something, or it would, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I stopped eating cooked food in restaurants. So now if I eat in a restaurant that isn't vegan, I eat a salad. That's all I eat. Yeah. Um, and, and which is no big deal. I love salads. I eat salads all the time. Yeah. And yeah. I, I had one right before I started this today. And, um, awesome. and, um, and so, you know, uh, uh, but, but there were no rest there, you know, now, now, I mean, uh, my God, I mean, the restaurants, I live in Philadelphia now and I have to, I have to tell you the, the, um, the restaurants here are just, I mean, Philadelphia is rivaling New York for, you know, the, for, for really excellent vegan restaurants. Excellent. Wow. excellent. Yeah. But, oh, that sounds fantastic. I mean, the, the UK is also incredibly progressive. I find it difficult to, uh, not eat no. out or, or order food given given the options available to me i'm getting hungry just thinking about it but um yeah. uh, i guess we'll move on to the next question uh yeah. so uh i guess just as a as a, a checkpoint or a placeholder we've got we've got roughly 12 questions currently left people have been adding and i know that a couple of people have their hands up um so are you are you you're happy to go on or do you want to you want to name a, a certain number and then we'll uh stop or? Let's, do the, let's do the 12 we got now see where we okay. are okay <laughs> fantastic yeah all right um so the next question comes from uh if we go here they're called care bears and their name is uh, sorry their question is uh how do you feel about rose's law uh basically giving animals a bill of rights what i, I don't even know what that i i don't even know what that is. rose's law no rose, you can't rose's law uh, which and then they just go on to clarify and say uh, basically giving animals a bill of rights. You can't give animals a bill of rights; they're property. You can you can't as long as animals are property. Talking about rights is nonsense. That was the that was the the subject of my 1995 book, Animals, Property, and the Law. Is you can't talk about giving animals rights as long as animals are property. And if animals stop being property, you don't need to give them a bill of rights because we won't be using them because they won't because institutionalized exploitation so, yeah. depends on the property status of animals will no longer no longer be in existence. Oh, very good point and very concise. Um, yeah, concise. Going up to the next one. Yeah, I, I did hear you actually uh, answered that earlier when talking about your uh, your companion animals as well. So yes, I think that one's already been touched on. But yes, on to the next question. Uh, so this one comes from uh, Lion, and it is, uh, do you think that using the word vegan is productive in advocacy, given its negative connotations? And goes on to then ask, uh, do you think it could be more productive to focus on animal rights as opposed to veganism? I focus on both of them. I mean, I don't, th I, I don't see, look, the negative thing about veganism is the fact that you, you know, I mean, look, there are some vegans who are obnoxious and, and go out of their way. You know, you got to understand something. 
people think of eating animals as normal. They think of it like as mm. breathing air and drinking water. They don't see it as, as problematic. You need to educate them about why it's problematic. I don't, I mean, I, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, you know, animal people, you know, start yelling at people in the streets and calling them Nazis because, you mm. know, well, you know, you're no better than a Nazi. You're no better than a rapist. And the answer is, well, you know, I understand what they're saying, but I don't think it's productive to sort of tell people. I mean, once you call people a Nazi, it's sort of, you know, it's that that's, it's that, that's I mean, what is a conversation killer. Um, and and um, and so I don't, you know, I, I I but I I love the word vegan. I just love the word vegan. And, but that said, I use animal rights all the time as well. And I also use nonviolence. I also, I mean, you know, because a lot of people are into nonviolence, but they're not vegans. And I always am telling them, if you're talking about nonviolence while you're shoveling the products of death into your mouth, then you need to rethink what you think about nonviolence. Um, and and so, you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't see anything wrong with vegan. You know, yeah, there are some people who have made, there are some vegans who have misbehaved. And there are some animal groups that go out of their way not to talk about veganism, but that's their business, mm. their thing. It's not my thing. I think it's also the potential for um, these people to be sort of stubborn in in wanting to say uh, that they don't want to call themselves vegan or don't want to associate with the term vegan. Um, yeah, I mean, look, th- some of the some of the biggest some of the biggest impediments from about to veganism come from animal people, you know, who are who are who go out of their way. To, you know, I mean, a lot of these, quote, intersectional, end quote, vegans who go out of their way to say veganism is not a moral baseline because that's racist or that's classist or that's this or that's that. I mean, you know, the, this is the problem. I mean, you know, we've got really, you know, without an animal movement, we'd be much further ahead. <laughs> but frankly, if you got rid of all of these 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 animal charities, we'd be much further ahead. They're a big problem. In my judgment, they are a huge problem. Because it is, the, it is the animal organizations that have produced the happy exploitation movement. I mean, the, the, there was there's a there's a, a letter I've written about it um, that was that was signed in 2005 by Peter Singer and and on behalf of PETA, Mercy for Animals, um, the Farm Animal Sanctuary, etc., praising Whole Foods for its animal compassionate standards. That to me was absolutely earth shattering in terms of what it did. It basically legitimized the happy exploitation movement. And that's what we have now. We have a happy exploitation movement. And I think that's a disaster. Those organizations should be ashamed of themselves in my view. Wow. Very, very powerful statements. Um, all right. I think that answers the question. Moving swiftly on. The next one is from Monster. And it's, uh, the question says, uh, if you rescue an animal who happens to be a carnivore, how would you take care of them? And how do you think people should take care of them? Um, and then goes on to clarify, aside from, you know, cats who can be uh, healthy on industrially supplemented vegan cat food. So I suppose uh, if, if an animal absolutely requires uh, a carnivorous diet uh, and you've rescued them, uh, how would you go about taking care of them? No, I mean, you know, look, it's never justifiable. I mean, I guess, I guess, I mean, I can I think you can draw a distinction between what's justifiable and what's excusable. You know, like, like if something's justifiable, it's all right to do. If something's excusable, it's not all right to do, but the, the culpability is mitigated by the compulsion. It's sort of the distinction between self-defense, you know, where, where if you reasonably believe someone's about to harm you and you harm them, that's more justifiable. If I come up to you and I say, if you don't go in there and rob the store, I'm going to kill your child. You go in and rob the store. Um, you might have the defensive excuse. What you did wasn't morally right, but we understand why you did it because you were acting under a compulsion. I don't think it, using animals is ever morally um, justifiable, but there may be situations in which you really don't have a meaningful choice Um or whatever you do, it's going to be a. It's, whatever you do, it's it's unsatisfactory. So if you've got an animal that's a carnivore, and you absolutely, you know, have to, um, I I don't know. I mean, you know, like I've I haven't I've I've not I've not had that situation happen, um, and so I don't know what I would do in a situation like that. Like if I had a if I had a a, a snake or something that could only mm-hmm. eat 
that could only eat an, you know live animals. I don't know what I would do. I would probably move heaven and earth to figure out how to get that snake reintegrated into the forest some way, <laughs> so that so that it you know so that the snake wasn't living with me. Um, as I say, I've got a lot of friends who have cats, and cats are obligate carnivores. Unlike dogs, dogs are not obligate carnivores. They're like us; they're omnivores. And so, cats. I've never had trouble with dogs being on a vegan diet. Never. They all. Lo- I mean, my dogs love vegan food. And so um, uh, I've never had a problem, but, you know, um, I don't know what I would do if I had a cat um, that that was, you know, absolutely, you know, I tried to get the cat to go vegan and I couldn't get the cat to go vegan. What would I do? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I probably would buy, you know, if you're buying cheap, if you're, well, I mean, if you're buying, you know, like, you know, the standard cat cat brands. I'm not sure you're really creating demand because those really are literally slaughterhouse floor sweepings. They they literally are. I mean, it's, it's like all the parts of the animal that, you know, are not that are, you know, that, that they're going to throw away, they turn into to, to camp. So it's part of, you know, it's, it's part of the economy of it. So it's wrong, but I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I, you know, mm-hmm. I probably, I probably would, but and it wouldn't be right. But it might, you know, what what do you do? Kill the cat? cat it's not the cat's fault. <laughs> you know, what do you do? Um, you know, and I think what I would probably do is whatever I could to get the cat to eat vegan. Um, and um, you know, but as I say, I've had I've had a number of friends who have tried, you know, in some cases really hard to get the cat their cats to go vegan and and have gotten them to go vegan. Uh and they they have healthy vegan cats. I have some some friends who who are, you know getting ulcers over the fact that they, they, you know, they tried really hard to get their cats to go vegan and they couldn't do it. And I, I, I always say, look, you know, are you vegan? Yeah. You know, I take my veganism very seriously. I've tried to get my cat to go vegan. And I said, well, you know, look, what feeding them animal products is not morally justifiable. It's wrong. But what are you going to do? What's the answer? Kill the cat? <laughs> it's not the cat's yeah. fault. Um, it's, a, it's a moral moral tragedy, I suppose. Yeah, it is. It is. It is you know, as, as I've often said, animals make moral messes that we cannot <laughs> up, we cannot clean up, you know, easily. You know, and and so what are you going to do? I mean, you know, I, I mean, it, it it's what what are you going to do? And, and I I. I find these facile answers. As I said, the I only I only remember one person um, who was actively campaigning to kill cats, um, and he was a strange person anyway. But um, but you know, I think I mean that's not an answer. I mean, you know, uh, that's that's absurd. Um, so I mean, animals make more. We've we've created these moral messes. What the hell are we going to do about it? Well, killing the animals isn't an answer in my judgment. So what are you going to do? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's uh, the way the way most people would agree is it's uh, it's a nuanced question that doesn't have a, a nice and easy clear uh, uh, answer that, that we can adopt in those cases. Um, but yes, moving on to the next question. So uh, this is from Has Vegan, and it, uh, the question says: Is it possible for one to become an ex-vegan? Sure. <laughs> you start you start eating animal products, you start wearing animal products, you start using animal products. Yes, of course you could be an ex vegan. I guess the question is uh maybe and, and this is maybe me reading into it, maybe the question is implying um if you if you stop uh being a vegan, if you uh if you um uh, sort of change your your moral opinion, as it were. If you, if you think animals deserve moral consideration, then you change your mind on that. Were you ever vegan in the first place? Sure. Of course you were. Mm. I mean, of course you were. You just changed your mind, and you, mm. and you went from right to wrong. <laughs> that's mm, yeah, all. yeah. That's all. Nothing, nothing complex there. Yes, I mm. mean, yeah, because I think people, I think people do go. I mean, you can be a vegan for different reasons. I mean, you can be. I mean, you know, uh, I've never met anybody who's been a vegan for purely environmental reasons who's consistent. Um, I've never met anybody who is purely vegan for health reasons. Everybody cheats on health things all the time. And, and so, you know, and that includes people who are, who are plant-based. They're not, they're more plant-based, but um, because they're not really vegan because most of those people will wear animal clothes and stuff as will many, as, as will many of the environment. I mean, most of the people I know who do it for environmental reasons, they wear animal clothes. So I, I wouldn't even consider them vegan because vegan is you don't eat them, wear them or use them. 
Um, but you know, do I know people who who you know didn't eat them, wear them? I I know very few people who were vegan in the sense of not eating them, wearing them, or using them. Who went back to eating them, wearing them, using them? I know people who stopped eating them for a while, who went back to eating them, but they were never vegan in the first place because they were they were people who who were still wearing them and using them for other purposes. Mm. But I suppose people who go vegan agree with uh, sort of the the ideology and the moral arguments and maybe are then convinced otherwise. Um, uh, very incorrect, but uh, perfectly possible. Yeah, I mean, and some people may do it not really sort of thinking about the philosophy of like, are they, you know, do they have moral value or do they don't have, they don't have more, you know, they do it because, you know, a bunch of their friends are doing it. I, mm. You know, you know, they may do it for a variety of reasons. I mean, it seems odd to me that somebody who really thought it through and came to the conclusion that they were morally obligated to be a vegan would stop doing that um, and, and, and conclude that animals don't have moral value. I mean, that would be odd. Did, can it happen? Sure. You know, I mean, I once thought if you want, if you once said to me years ago, Donald Trump was going to be president, I would have thought you were crazy. Uh, you know, I mean, I would have thought, you know, what are you nuts? Um, but, you know, lots of strange things happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, so moving on. Uh, this question comes from uh, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. I apologize. It looks like it says Monaho. Um, and the question is, uh, what is the abolitionist position on humans hunting wild animals in nature? Wild animals are not "quote unquote" property in the way that domesticated animals are. Assuming that wild animals are not being domesticated, only then to be hunted. No, they are. They are property. All animals are property. They're they're the property of wild non domesticated animals are generally the property of the state. I mean, it depends on where you are um, and what their legal status is. Um, but they generally have. I mean, as a general matter, animals um, almost all animals are are have. Are, are, are property of somebody, um, even in, you know, I mean, in almost all places, um, the state can regulate what you can kill and when you can kill the, those animals. So, they, but it would be wrong. I mean, just because they're not, I mean, they, as I say, they, they are property. Um, and, and the fact that they're not domesticated, they're not produced in the way domesticated animals are produced doesn't change the fact that we still thingify them and treat them um, as, as, as property, even if they're not domesticated animals. And I'm opposed to all hunting, too. And, and that includes by indigenous populations. This idea that all of a sudden it's okay if they're indigenous population. You know, no, it's not okay. <laughs> it's mm. not okay. Um, you know, it doesn't become okay just because people have been doing it for a long time. People have been doing lots of bad stuff for a long time. doesn't make it okay. Absolutely. Yeah, a common argument that's used against yeah, veganism and yeah. a very, very strange one if you think about it for more than three seconds, I think. Um, so the next question uh, we're going back to has vegan. Uh, and he asks, uh, do you think it is problematic to refer to non-human animals with the it pronoun? Yeah, I, I did. I didn't. He's not saying. He's not saying I did that, is he? No, no, no. I don't. Oh, okay. I don't believe so. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I think. I, I think it's. It's a bad idea generally because it. It. It sort of makes them things. I mean, I do understand the fact that you know generally when we don't know the sex of a baby, people can refer to baby human babies as its. You know. Um. Uh. You know. Uh. Um. It, it, Without sort of thinking, without without sort of thinking that the baby is the thing, it's just you don't know the sex of the baby, so you say you know it. Um, I, I tend to uh, avoid that both with respect to babies <laughs> and with respect to to non human animals because I think it reinforces the idea that they're things, and I think that's a bad idea. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. I mean, so uh, we've got a few more questions from Haz here uh, in, in quick succession. Uh, so the next one is, uh, do you wish for the implementation of some kind of legal protection for or recognition of non-human animals as persons? I think we've already uh, I think we've already covered that one. It, it ain't going to it ain't going to happen. I mean, yeah. not, not even I mean, you know, the, the non-human rights project that Steve Wise is heading up in terms of trying to get some court to recognize that elephants or non-human great apes are 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 persons he's not even he's not even directly challenging this the the property status of animals i mean it, it, i don't think the law is going to be any use at all until um we have a significant vegan population then then laws might 
be useful in certain ways to to eradicate certain practices and things like that. Yes, the laws might be more useful, but right now they're not going to they're not going to do a damn thing. Yeah, I think uh, I, again, we, we uh, I think we discussed that quite a bit earlier, especially uh, with with uh, reference to the Bill of Rights question. Uh, so that was yeah, I think we've had that one already. Um, Okay, so the next one from uh, Has Vegan is, uh, what are some of your favorite street activism ideas for challenging speciesism and promoting veganism? Uh, and then give some examples, like giving out samples of quote unquote dog milk, uh, hosting a debate table, uh, going to non-vegan events, uh, like community bar barbecues and interviewing people. Uh, what, what would be some of your favorites? All of, the, all of the, those things are all fine. I mean, you know, I, just getting out and educating people. It's like creative, I always say creative nonviolent education. What does that mean? It means whatever the hell you want it to mean. Um, you know, it's, it's unlimited. You know, it's limited only by your imagination. So, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not in favor of, I don't think as a general matter, you know, a lot of the street activism that goes on now is particularly productive in part in large part because it's instant activism it's like you don't have to learn anything you just show up put on a guy fox mask and hold a hold a laptop showing a slaughterhouse video and you become an activist or you go you know with direct action everywhere and you go into a restaurant and start yelling at people which i always thought was sort of idiotic but um but you know i i don't i don't think of that stuff as being particularly useful as a matter of fact i think of it as as in certain ways being counterproductive but there are all sorts of things you can do that are creative and nonviolent. You know, I mean, just just setting up a table in places where people are going by and having animals. I mean, food activism is great. Giving people samples of vegan food so that people see that you're not, you know, you don't eat styrofoam or, you know, or that, you know, that you, you in fact, that vegan food is actually quite delicious. And you can do that with relatively small amounts of money. I know people, I mean, I, I know people who do that sort of stuff all the time and they, you know, they hand they hand out food samples. They talk to people about vegan cooking, about vegan. You know, they 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 give people information about. You know, they give them recipes. They talk to them about animal rights stuff. I mean, you know, always in a sort of a nonviolent, very creative, very open, very you know, uh, productive way. But yeah, you know, going to going to to you know to. Going to play, I mean, going to places where there are people who love animals and or think they love animals and try to talk to them about, you know, what loving animals means, you know, to going to going to a place where, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a local humane society that's having a meat oriented thing uh, and, you know, not going there and becoming obnoxious and yelling at people, but going and saying, you know, does it make sense? Um, to talk about, you know, our, our concern about animals while we're serving animals. Does that make sense? Talk to people, you know, talk to people. But see, the beauty, the beauty of, of living in 2022 is we have this thing called the Internet that we're talking on right now. You know, this stuff didn't exist. You know, when I first started doing this work, it didn't exist. You couldn't, you know, in the 90s, when I... Um, you know, I when I, after I wrote Rain Without Thunder, which I wrote in 1996, which basically said the animal rights movement was falling apart because it was embracing an animal welfare ethic. Basically, all the groups stopped talking to me and I stopped getting invited to all the conferences. And I was, for all intents and purposes, dead because um, that was the way we all communicated in those days. You know, before the Internet really took off. You had to be involved with these organizations because they used to have these conferences. You know, they used to have conferences every year. And you you talk to people by going to the conferences and by writing articles for their, their you know, for things like Animals Agenda and Animal, what was it? What, I think it was called Animal People. I think that was the other one. Uh, there were two main sorts of things. It was Animals Agenda and Animal People, I believe. Um and you had to be publishing in one of those things, you know, to get out to people to, you know, and, and I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, you could do things, you know, as a professor, you could do it academically, which I was doing, but you know, that's limited to the university context and the students and whatnot. But, um, but as far as the, as far as the, the, the movement, the animal, animal movement was concerned, you had to be part of these organizations. And so when I, when I ran afoul of them by writing Rain Without Thunder in 1996, which I must tell you did piss people off, much to my surprise. I thought I thought they would receive it much, much better way. They didn't like it at all. They were very upset with me for writing it. And um, 
And, and, um, but I stand by every word I said in that book. I stand by it, st- stood by it then, I stand by it now. The only criticism I would have of my book is that I didn't go far enough. I, I didn't realize it was as bad as it was. It was actually much worse than I, I, n- I never thought it was going to get as bad as it's gotten now. And, um, and so, um, but I was all, for all intents and purposes dead. I was like relegated to being a regular, you know, I was, I was doing my work as a professor. I was lecturing in universities and classes and stuff like that. But I was, you know, I, I had ceased to exist in the movement. And then the 2000s came along and a guy named Randy Sandberg, who was then working for, um, uh, who was working for uh, uh, Apple Computer, he contacted me and said I needed a website. I said, nah, I'm not interested in websites. I'm not interested in it. And he told me, he said, you know, you needed to do it. And he kept after me. And um, he kept after me. And and um, and eventually I said, look, y- you do it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll provide the, I'll provide the, um, the, uh, the content. Um and you you can do the technical stuff. I can't, I'm not going to do the technical stuff. He did it. We set up the we set up the abolitionist approach. It went nut. I mean, it really went wild. And um, and so you know, but it's it's different now. You don't need these organizations to, to talk to each other and to be organized. And I communicate with people all over the world all the time who are doing activism and want to talk with me about, you know, how they should approach this, how they should approach that. And I talk to them. I mean, I basically make myself accessible. I talk with them. It's part of my activism is dealing with them. And, um, and so, you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's great. I think you, you, you clearly have very, um, uh, passionate, um, and, and very, uh, strong views about, about the kinds of, uh, the kinds of ways we treat animals and the kinds of ways people think we should treat animals. Um, and yet it seems that, um, your, your, I mean, just from your answer there, it looks like some of your favorite forms of street activism tend to be the ones that are more compassionate and more, more reasonable, more sensible, which I think is uh, something that's very admirable. Look, you've got, you've got to understand something. People grow up believing that this is complete. You see, yes, you can say that animal exploitation is like, you know, what the Nazis did or what rapists do, because they, all of these things involve violations of fundamental rights. But the psychological differences are tremendous mm. in that in that when people grow up believing, you know, they associate eating animals with like having Thanksgiving dinner at their grandmother's who's now mm. dead and they miss grandma. And they, you know, I mean, the, it, 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 you're, 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 you're educated to believe it's all not only normal, but you know, that it's not pathological, but it's really normal and desirable. And what you need to do is to educate people about the pathology of it, because what they've been taught to believe is that using animals is okay, as long as animals are treated okay. And they may not be happy about the way animals are treated, but it's not the use itself that's the problem. And that is the ideology of animal welfare. And what you've got to do is you've got to sort of challenge that but you don't challenge that by going up to somebody and saying you're a nazi i mean i literally have seen i literally have seen animal people go up to people who are in restaurants eating and saying you're a nazi you're no different from, you know, and you just want to say you want to cry and say no 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 that's not going to work um yeah. and you know i remember i remember years ago uh i was walking down sixth avenue in new york city um, with uh, a guy named Cleveland Amory, who was, you know, who was the head of a group called Fun for Animals. Fun for Animals um, merged with HSUS, with the Humane Society of the United States, but it once used to be a freestanding organization. It was run by a guy named Cleveland Amory. And Cleveland was probably, you know, the he was, he was like, he was a, he'd been around forever. He started, he started that organization, I think in the 50s. Um, and, and I was walking down 6th Avenue with him and we passed the Hilton, and there was a woman out there handing handing out um, uh, flyers for a fur fest, for a fur. You know, they they were having some fur event inside. You know, like like a you know I don't know what the hell they were, they were having some fur event. You know, they they had fur vendors there. They were whatever. And he and she and, and they were exhibiting furs. And he he hands she hands him this 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 flyer, and he said, "My dear, that coat makes you look fat." And, and I, I wanted to crawl under a rock, uh, and we walked away and I said, you know, I said, I don't know why the hell you did that. I said, because whether she looks fat or not is neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. I said, but what you've done is basically you've guaranteed that she's never, ever 
going to think well of the ideas that are supposedly important to both of us. Although we were very different people because Cleveland, even though he ran Fun for Animals and even though he was considered a grand American animal rights activist, was not a vegan or a vegetarian. He, he ate animals. He wore leather. He wore wool. And I it's something that you know he and I used to argue about endlessly, but um, but you know so that's the sort of thing you don't you don't get you know you don't you know you don't get people to to sort of persuaded of your view by like going up to women and saying you look fat in that fur coat that ain't going to that that that's that's rude it's uncivilized and it's counterproductive, um, and and I don't even talk I mean frankly I I don't I don't even talk I mean. I've never understood about why people go after fur. You know, I mean, go after wool, go after leather, go after fur, but all of them together. I remember once Friends for Animals asked me to speak at Fur Free Friday in New York City in in, um, in, uh, uh, Central Park. And I said uh, to Priscilla, who's a friend of mine and I like very much, um, I said to Priscilla, I will speak, but I will not speak for Fur Free Friday. I will speak for Animal Clothing Free Friday. And I will talk about all of the problems with animal clothing and why we should, you know, why why it's an issue that we must include along with eating animals and using animals in other ways. But I'm not going to talk about fur. And I didn't. And I don't talk about fur. Um, you know, I mean, I talk about animal clothing. It's a problem. We shouldn't use any animals for clothing. Wool, leather, silk, fur, any of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, all right. Moving on to the next question. Uh, what do you think about routine forced sterilization of animals? I'm all in favor of it. Well, forced, I mean, hey, look, I think we ought to sterilize every domesticated animal we can and stop them from reproducing. This idea that animals have a right to reproduce is is uh, domesticated animals have a right to reproduce makes no sense to me whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I think it's absurd. Um, if we've cons- if we've come to the conclusion that domestication is an is is an all right is a is a bad thing, and I believe it is, if we come to the conclusion that domestication is a bad thing, we ought to stop it, and you only stop it by stopping the reproduction of animals. And I mean, I I find it bizarre when I hear animal people talking about the right of domesticated animals to reproduce. These are domesticated animals. And they can't, I mean, they may have an urge to want to have sex. I doubt that they're particularly interested in reproducing per se. I mean, they want, they, they may want to have sex. Um, but I mean, that I understand. But I, I don't understand um, this idea that, you know, we have to protect their interest in having offspring. They can't take care of their offspring. They're domesticated animals. It puts them in a situation. It puts, it, they're in a vulnerable situation. It makes them more vulnerable. So, I mean, my view is, you know, obviously, if we had, you know, if we had, um, uh, uh, um, you know, if there's a less intrusive way to to uh, uh, sterilize an animal, then that we ought to do that. But we ought to stop all domesticated animals from reproducing. Because, you know, the bottom line is these people who say <coughs> we shouldn't you know, get upset about spaying and neutering dogs and cats – well, you can't just draw the line at, at dogs and cats. If you're going to take the position that sterilization is wrong, you got to take it. It's wrong for chickens. It's wrong for for cows. It's wrong for pigs. It's wrong for lambs. It's wrong for you know. And so basically, what are you going to do? We have like sixty trillion, um, you know, farm animals all over the place because you believe that animals have a right to reproduce. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right, excellent response. I think uh, we'll move on to the next question. We've got two, probably. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we get to with these. But um, uh, so the next question comes from uh, Code, and it says, "Are plants deserving of moral consideration?" No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, plants, plants are not sentient, um, and and um, they're not sentient. Uh, they're alive, but they're not sentient. There is no evidence, and I mean no evidence, none whatsoever, that they have any sort of mind that prefers, desires, or wants anything. Yes, they have complicated reactions. They have evolved complicated reactions, but they are not sentient. They have no subjective awareness. They have no nervous system. They have no brain. They have no nerve net. They have, I mean, you know, they're not sentient. And even if they were, which they're not, even if they were, since it takes 
like between three and 16 pounds of plant protein to produce one pound of flesh, depending on the animal and the circumstances in which the animal is raised, it would still be morally obligatory not to eat the animals because then you would be eating the three to 16 pounds of plants in addition to the animal who clearly is sentient. So I don't really worry about the the um, uh, plant issue at all. And frankly, neither does anybody. I mean, the only... You hear the plant issue when people like have nothing else to say. They got you, you hear about plants along with Hitler was a vegetarian, which he wasn't, by the way. But um, it's a, an absurd argument. No, I mean, I don't walk on grass if I can avoid it, not because I'm worried about the grass, but because I don't like to step on insects. I don't know whether they're sentient, but I err in favor of thinking they're sentient. And I don't want to kill them. So I don't walk on grass. Um and sometimes I go, go like way out of my way not to walk. And when I'm walking my dogs, I'm always like looking down to make sure I'm not stepping on insects and stuff. But I mean, you know, the idea that plants are sentient, I don't know where anybody got that idea. And, if, you know, people say, well, you know, this, this study came out and this study. Look at what these people are saying. They're, what they're saying is if you actually read the study and don't read the, the daily news article about the study, which are always sens- sensational, if you actually read the study, um, the study will say that there's this reaction and that reaction and this reaction and that. You know, yeah, plants have complicated reactions. I have no doubt they've been evolving for you know millions of years. I mean, you know, yeah. they, they they have complicated reactions. But the fact that they have complicated reactions um, doesn't mean that they're sentient. I mean, the bottom line is is that if I take a cigarette lighter, you know, and I hold it to a dog, the dog will run away. If I take a cigarette lighter and I hold it to a plant, the plant will just like sort of shrivel up. The plant will turn towards the sun, even if there's a, you know, in the direction of the sun, even if there is a lawnmower coming along that's going to chop the, the plant up. Um, you know, whereas the dog will not run into the to the lawnmower. I mean, it. it I, I don't understand this. This plants as sentient stuff is just. Um, I mean, I understand why people people say it, but I mean, you know, because it's like they're. But I, you know, I also look at that when people when I'm at a dinner party and I start getting the plants are sentient thing. I, I actually don't get. I mean, I know an, some animal people get really pissed off about that and they get very angry, and I don't because I figure if that's what you got to say, then you're desperate. <laughs> you're 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 engaged, but you're desperate. And you don't know what to say. So you're not telling me plants are sentient or Hitler was a vegetarian. And and those are easy. Those arguments are easy to deal with. And I always I always, you know, engage them and say, now, look, let's think about this for a second. You know, what did you read about? You know, and then, you know, they generally quote something where I, I've actually read the study. So I'm actually able to like, for example, there was a somebody came up to me at a party and started talking about plant sentient and then said, well, there was this guy in Tel Aviv and he said plants were sentient. And I said, um, and I said, I know that study, and I know that guy who wrote that, who who wrote what you're talking about, and he specifically said he didn't think plants were sentient. He just was talking about the complexity of their reactions. And I said, I have no doubt that they have complex reactions, but they are that they are just that they are complex reactions. They are not cognitive responses of any sort. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd, I'd agree with you. Uh, the uh, sort of non-vegans approaching that as, as an argument is, like you say, it's sort of a last resort. Um, or what exactly. else can I say? Um, exactly. Although I'm also getting pinged. Uh, there's there's quite a few uh, vegans on this server. It's become sort of a hot topic, uh, and and I guess less about whether or not plants are sentient, and more about whether or not plants deserve moral consideration, uh, which I think is maybe slightly more nuanced. But I'm sure there are some people who would like to have uh, conversations with you. Well, well, look, we get. We, I mean, if they if they don't if they're not if they're not sentient, they don't have any interest. If they don't have any interest, then you can't adversely affect them. If you can't adversely affect them, then to say that they should they should have moral consideration, I don't even understand what that means. I can understand that that I should be concerned about eating plants if I'm eating so many of them that I'm denying other people nutrition. I understand that. Um, I understand obligations that can concern the plants, but I can't have a direct moral obligation that I owe to the plants because there's nothing I, nothing I do can adversely affect a piece of lettuce. Nothing, not a damn thing <laughs> can adversely affect the lettuce. So to say, well, there should be moral consideration for the lettuce. This doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, and then we have this question here again from code um, is buying vegan products from non-vegan companies, vegan and or moral. Well, you can't avoid it, my friend. You can't avoid it because I don't care what what company. I mean, <laughs> the the answer is yes, it is. What what what? Whether it's vegan depends on what's in it. Okay, not who made it. Because if you start once you start getting into the who made it situation, 
You can have a company that is completely vegan, but is owned by a non-vegan parent. You can have a company that's owned by a non-vegan, by a vegan parent, but that employs non-vegan employees to deliver stuff. There's no way to draw those lines in in a coherent way. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no way to draw, to draw lines. Absolutely none. So you know, I mean, my view is is that if I'm buying a, 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 a you know some broccoli, I don't I don't even care as to who the parent company is. It doesn't matter because all money is dirty. All money is dirty. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that last comment, I'm sure a lot of people would agree with you as well. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've got a few uh, non or well, actually, no, we haven't got a few non vegan questions. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so the the first question in the non vegan section. Oh gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher all of these. Um, okay. So the first question is uh, very curious if you are familiar with. Uh, with Cora Diamond and <laughs> the new Whitgen, oh gosh, <laughs> Whitgen. Okay, okay. Cora Diamond, yeah. Cora Diamond. When I was in graduate school, I was a teaching assistant for Cora Diamond, and um, and I have remained friends with Cora Diamond um, over the years. As a matter of fact. On the back of my most recent excellent book, um, right below David Benatar is Cora Diamond, um, and saying that she liked book. But I, Cora Diamond is a dear friend. I I love Cora very much, um, and um, and the new Wittgenstein. You know, Wittgenstein is, a, is an acquired taste. I I have to say I I'm not sure I really acquired it all that well, but but I'm friendly with Cora. And uh, with Rupert Reed at the University of East Anglia, he's a colleague of mine because I'm an honorary professor of philosophy there. And Rupert is one of the people who writes about the new Wittgenstein. And, um, you know, as I say, uh, Wittgenstein is, there are people who are obsessed with Wittgenstein. I am not one of them. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions that you've already answered. Um, here we go. And I think this, so this may be, uh, in relation to, uh, something we discussed earlier. Uh, the question is, uh, do you think animal rebellions kind of violent action is effective for the animal rights movement? No, I think animal rebellion is absurd and it's not, I mean, I think animal, animal rebellion is a joke. Um, it will not even take the position that v these are, these are people who claim to be concerned about the environment. I have news for you. If we don't get rid of, or, or at least substantially reduce, and I mean substantially reduce, not talking about meatless Monday nonsense, but if we don't substantially reduce animal exploitation, we are going to be uh, unable to avoid climate catastrophe. So for animal rebellion to take the position that we're concerned about fossil fuels, but we're not going to take a position on, on, on animal exploitation because we're going to wait for the citizens' committees to decide that, that's nuts. That's crazy. Crazy, and they're they're somewhat hostile to veganism. Uh, no, I take that back. They are hostile to veganism, um, and so uh, yeah. And, and now, as far as their 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 direct actions are concerned, I mean, you know, if people really believe that gluing themselves to you know the <laughs> to, to, to to subway cars in London is you know or or gluing themselves to, you know i mean I, I they were a couple of years ago they were that's what they were doing they were like gluing themselves to various things um you know and, and i mean disrupting traffic and stuff i mean we need to be concerned about the environment but you know, having having a group of of non vegans pretending that they're back at Woodstock, um, you know, and or pretending that they're hippies or whatever, and having come from that generation, I can tell you they're not. Um, but for them, you know, to be thinking that you know this is this is not this, this is not doing anything productive. We we ought to be concerned about the environment. We ought to be concerned about burning fossil fuels. But we also ought to be concerned about the fact that. Animal agriculture is producing more greenhouse gas than all of the burning of fossil fuel for transportation. So, like, we need to be seeing this in a in a more intelligent way, and we need to be um, focusing people's attention in productive ways rather than in um, incoherent ways. I, I don't see Animal Rebellion's position as coherent. Talking about fossil fuel when you're not talking about animal agriculture makes no sense to me. 
I think uh, I think that was uh, in reference to uh, Extinction Rebellion, the movement. Uh, so uh, yeah, Extinction, Extinction Rebellion. I'm sorry, what did I say? Yes. yes. Uh, so so the question was uh, around uh, the movement Animal Rebellion. I'm not sure if you're. Oh, animal, animal rebellion! Animal rebellion is what what popped up when could because Extinction Rebellion was not talking about animal about mm. vegan. Animal rebellion showed up, but animal rebellion problematically. Um, I have a friend who's who's very close with them, and um, uh, animal rebellion does not take the position that individuals ought to be vegan. They they say that there should be system change, but but that it's not an it's not it's not an obligation of individuals to go vegan. Uh, that makes no sense to me. You can't have system change unless you have people who are willing to you know who support that system change. So to say, well. You know, you don't have to be vegan, and we don't have to take a position that people have an obligation to be vegan. We just have an oblig. We just have a. Our position is that systems ought to move to being vegan. How the hell are they going to do that? That's like mm-hmm. saying we don't. You don't. You can be a racist. We're perfectly happy if you're a racist. You don't have to be a, a, a oppose racism. We just have to oppose racism as an institutional matter. Well, if the people who are involved in the movement don't oppose racism, then how the hell are you going to, you know, what, what, is it, what sense does it make to talk about getting rid of vegan uh, racism as an institutional matter? Mm. No, understandable. All right, let's we well, let's finish up because I got I got a bunch of, of things. Course, to do. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got this is the last question. Are you happy to to end it here? Yeah, then? yeah I am. I am happy to. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, so the question is from Code, and it is: uh, Is sentience the only morally relevant uh, trait when determining whether something has moral value? Yep, absolutely. It's necessary and it's sufficient. It's necessary because if a being is not sentient, then that being has no interest and there's nothing that we can do that adversely affects it. Plants aren't sentient. There's nothing that I can do to adversely affect a piece of lettuce. Absolutely nothing that I can do to affect. And so it's necessary to be sentient, to have interests. And once you have, once you are sentient and you have interests, that's all you need. You do not need any level of cognition. You don't need to be able to have human-like self-awareness or be able to engage in rational conduct the way we typically understand that with a normally functioning human. You don't need to have those cognitive characteristics. Sentience is necessary and sufficient for moral value. Excellent. All right. Fantastic uh, final answer. Thank you very much, Gary. All right. Um, Well, that's that's three hours and 15 minutes. And (laughs) and it's three hours and 15 minutes. And I actually could do another three hours and 15 minutes, but I have like a bunch of things I have to get done. And and but but really, you, you become ve- if you're not vegan, become a vegan because you'll have you'll you'll. It, I don't care what anybody says about the health aspects of it. Was best best thing I ever did. I didn't do it for health reasons. I did not do it for health reasons. But now that I'm old, I have to tell you, um, it's um, it's a lot better being an old vegan than uh, than seeing all of the all of my other friends who are my age basically, and they're on every pharmaceutical you can possibly imagine. Anyway, people. Peace, take care, and um, we've got to do something about about Pake working at a non-vegan restaurant serving non-vegan food. Um, And I think we ought to have um, uh, a discussion in the next couple weeks focusing on Pake's moral problems here. Um, Let him know. Yeah, yeah, please do let him know. Thank you very much for inviting me. Be well, everybody. Take care. And uh, um, if you want more information, I have two websites, abolitionistapproach.com, which has a lot of my theoretical stuff, and howdoigovegan.com, which has a lot of practical stuff on veganism, lots of recipes, cheap, easy recipes. And uh, I have a Facebook page that I interact with people on, a Twitter page, an Instagram page. And I, I like to I like to interact with people to the extent that I, I spend a lot of time uh, doing these sorts of things. I'm happy to talk with y'all. And um, if you have questions that absolutely need you need to get to me um, personally, you can write to me at gary.francione at rutgers.edu, gary.francione at rutgers.edu. And I will try, although I get zillions of emails, I will try to answer you. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for, for your excellent questions. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much on behalf of the entire community. The, the chat is absolutely flooded with thank you messages. Um, very, very interesting, very productive, and uh, we hope to have you back very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Gary.